speakers and contributors for the day, and we'll come to that in more detail later, but we've been very grateful for those who are coming to address us today. For this weekend of commemoration, I think I'm probably right in thinking started life as a conversation within the Lodge family about keeping the commemoration of Raymond Lodge's uh, 100th anniversary of his death. Raymond Lodge died on 14th of September 1915 uh, uh, in Flanders. And I think the question arose as to how this commemoration might be marked. And that was the point, Lisa, at which you um, visited St. George's here and approached us with the thought about a commemorative service that would both remember Raymond and also uh, remember other men of the parish and the Edgemaster and Lanewood area who were also killed in the war at that time. And tomorrow we will have a service of commemoration and hope for the future that will do those two very things. And everybody is most warmly invited to come and join us for that service. And we'll be laying commemorative wreaths. And we'll also be dedicating our new peace garden out in the church garden. Out of that initial uh, thought came part two, which is today which was an opportunity to have a look together at some of the issues that were lively at the time, both for the Lodge family and also more widely in society. And that particularly uh, was to be focused around Sir Oliver Lodge as Raymond's father and some of his work as a physicist, also his work in psychical research and his interest and Lady Mary's interest also in spiritualism, and how this was connected also to the experience of the World War and the intensity of that experience, particularly in relation to grieving families. And so today was born as a day of being able to come and have a look at these issues together. And as I say, we're delighted that people have been willing to come and share their expertise and insight into some of these matters, including members of the family. And just at the beginning, can I on your behalf thank very much Lisa uh, and Jane Darnton of St. George's, who together have worked over about 18 months on today uh, and this weekend. We're enormously grateful um, for all that's been put together and constructed so that we can come together like this. Thank you all so much for coming, and Jane's going to say just a little bit more, I think, about the program. Yes, thank you, Julie. First of all, boring housekeeping things. If you are hard of hearing and you need our tea loop, you'll find that you might be better on that side or in the end of the pew, but nobody seems to be having problems. Um, loos, maybe you found them, are at the back of the church. One, two, three. Um, there's a kitchen. Should we have a fire, which is pretty unlikely, the exits are on the four corners. You'll see green exit, green exit, green exit, and out through there. So that's if we have a fire. Um, there is an electric cable which trails across that aisle with silver tape on it. Please don't trip over it. Um, I think those are the really boring things. Oh, lunchtime, the church is open, so some of you may be going out to find sandwiches and things. Some of you may have brought a picnic. You're welcome to be outside if it's fine or in the church. Unfortunately, the delicatessen, which is such an obvious thing over the road, is closed on Saturday because it works for business people. There's, uh, there are various eateries towards five ways up there. Um, and Morrison's, the large supermarket, has got sandwiches and things, should you be short. Uh, there's water and, you know, if you're short of water and things, it's in the kitchen. So I think that's that housekeeping done. Um, and otherwise, we will progress through the day. And um, although Julian thinks it was hard work, actually it was a pleasure. I got absolutely fascinated by Lodge and his family. And I started off because I'd always known about that plaque. And then I read Julian Barnes' book, Arthur and George, and realised the link between Arthur Cohen and Doyle and Lodge. And then I was a close fam uh, family friend of Robert Graves, who uh, knew all about the 
First World War, and obviously his friend Secret Sassoon's mother was very influenced by Lodge's spiritual spiritualism, as were the Kiplings and a great swathe of the middle classes. Spiritualism was extremely popular at that time and influenced a lot of people. So in our programme today, we are leading through, as it were, the paterfamilias and uh, the fact that they lived in a house, if you haven't all realised, just over the road, literally over the road from the church. But all that is left of that house now are the two peer peers of the gate called Marymont. So the family attended the church. One of the daughters was married here, Violet. And um, the reason Lodge moved here was he was passing by and saw the funeral of the previous owner and thought, aha, I think I might be able to rent that house. <laughs> And there's a lovely census which he signed at the bottom in his own, own hands, which said there are 26 rooms in this house when counted properly. He was obviously a scientific stickler for the truth. So I got, I got very fascinated by the whole family, and I hope you're going to have the most interesting day. I'm very, very much indebted to the speakers. Slightly concerned because Julian, who is singing at noon, doesn't seem to be here yet. Uh-huh, okay, right, he isn't here. And I'm also indebted to everybody who's brought things for the memorabilia, particularly the University of Birmingham, who have brought things that were very precious, things that were on Rain's person when he died. So I hope you all have time to look at this. And members of the family have also brought lovely things. So let's start off with Lodge the Scientist and Lodge in Birmingham. And um, this is, I'm going to call him Jim because everybody calls him Jim. I think I put him down as James. But here we are, here's, here's Jim from the University of Leeds who's involved with the Lodge Society. But here we are, here's, here's Jim from the University of Leeds who's involved with the Lodge Society. So, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Can, can everyone... Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks Jane, thanks Elisa for all the hard work in putting this together. Um, and, and what a privilege it is to speak to so many of the Lodge family. What a treat to speak in, in St George's as well. I'm thrilled, <laughs> thrilled to be here um, and slightly nervous <laughs> about speaking about all of these experts. But what I want to do this morning is to explore some of the Lodge's years in Birmingham. The Lodges, Oliver and Mary and their 12 children, moved to Birmingham in 1900. Lodge, as you all know, came at the invitation of, of, to, of Joseph Chamberlain to become the first principal of his new University of Birmingham. The Lodges then spent the next 19 years in the city, living just across the road. One of the things I'm going to argue in my, in my, my time is that Birmingham and the years that Sir the Lodge spent here made Lodge. And while Lodge didn't quite make Birmingham, he certainly helped make its university. So of the Lodge had established a scientific name before he came to the city, but it was here that he became a national figure, a representative of science, of the new universities, and increasingly of a progressive philosophy that offered to unite science, religion, and spiritualism. By the time he left Birmingham, Lodge was the most famous scientist in Britain, and possibly the world. Yet there is something odd about how we remember Saul of the Lodge, and in particular, how we remember his Birmingham years. And Jane, can you go back a couple of slides? Sorry. And again? Next, and again? Sorry, I <laughs> that's it. That's stop. Well, well, stop there, that's fine, that's a good place to be. Okay. Um, this is partly um, Saul of the Lodge's fault the reason we remember him in a, in a slightly strange way. His autobiography, Past Years, focuses on his youth. It's a book of about 380 pages. I should have checked exactly how long it is. 80 pages are dedicated to the Liverpool years. Birmingham gets 17 pages, and five of those are taken up with the Lodge family trip to Egypt. Okay, so Birmingham is a sliver of the book. Liverpool has a statue of Lodge. Um, the physics building on the University of Liverpool is named after him. In Birmingham, there is just a plaque that's through there in the room for you to see. Um, and on Birmingham University's campus, there's nothing to remember on the Lodge. Even Lodge's archive has a kind of amnesia about it. And this is a page in the, in the scrapbooks in the Cadbury Research Library. And in the big square brackets, which you, which you probably can't see, says, unless I find some other cuttings that I haven't been, I, I, when I have 
when I can't read much. Hundreds, thank you, through the library. Um, the, the years 1909 to 1929 are missing. So the, the, all those scrapbooks aren't part of the Cadbury Research Library collection, and Helen Alvey's little note there who records that. So today, as we mark the centenary of death, of the death of Raymond Lodge, it's right, I think, to think a little bit about memory and those who remember. History is a funny kind of remembering, working away in the Lodge archive, which keeps different aspects of Lodge's life at arm's length, the sciences in Liverpool, the spiritualisms in the archives of the SPR, etc. Um, scholars like me try and put all of Lodge back together again. Lodge himself, though, in his book Raymond, also tried to get a life in order, to both remember Raymond's life in this world and insist on his continuing life in the next. Somewhere between these two, between a history that uses archival remains to resurrect the dead and a spiritualism that maintains that the dead live on, I think Lodge and his archive have something to tell us about memory and memorialisation. Thinking about Lodge, and thinking about Lodge, thinking about Raymond, offers a way to understand the work of remains in helping us to remember. How does what we remember depend upon what's been left behind? Um, so this, this, if you could, the next slide please, Jim. Thank you. This couple comes out of um, uh, an AHRC funded project, which has just come to an end. It's been running for two years, and we had a series of workshops in various locations. The first was at the University of Birmingham, the second at the Royal Society in London, the third in Liverpool, and the fourth was up in Leeds uh, just, just last April, um, last April, last March. Um, the, the main goal of the project was to bring together those who are interested in Lodge and just think a bit about the reason why he seems to fall between various academic disciplines. Those interested in spiritualism know about Lodge as a spiritualist, those interested in the history of science know him as a scientist, and he seemed to be a tangential player in all these larger bodies of work. So we wanted to get everyone together and try and understand him a, a bit more in the round. And what we've learned about Lodge over the last two years is that he had many, many interests. And there is lots more that we still don't know about him. So, Jane, if you can move on to the next slide. The, the, what I'm going to say is a, a, a little bit about who was on the Lodge, because you all know, right? Uh, but I think there might be some people maybe who aren't quite as familiar uh, as others. So I'm going to do that really quick. And then I'm going to spend more or less than the time, the bulk of my time, talking about Lodge and the Birmingham years. Uh, and then I'm just going to finish off by, with some reflections on, on memory and remembering. Okay, so who was Lodge? Thank you. Um, uh, and, and again, please, actually. Thanks. Um, I'm not going to read all this out. Um, this is one of my favourite photos of Lodge in past years. Um, he, he, he was, as you know, born in 1851 in Penkles, outside Stoke. Uh, his father used to work on the railway and then went into business um, de delivering spine clay to the potteries in, in the area. Um, in 1859, Lodge went to school unhappily uh, in, in Newport Grammar School in Shropshire uh, and then to, into Coombs in Suffolk. Um, at the age of 14, he left school and began to work for his father and he got his real education from his aunt Anne, who was a fascinating woman actually, I'd like to know more about her if, if people know, who was a former, bed, uh, former uh, bed uh, woman of the bedchamber to Queen Adelaide, and she introduced Lodge to science while on a, on a holiday in Blackpool, and crucially allowed him to live with her in London on a short trip as a teenager, where he got to hear some of his scientific heroes, like John Tyndall at the Royal Institution. Um, Lodge then studied in London, uh, well, he, he studied, he did a, a BSc externally through London University, and then spent six weeks in London studying at South Kensington. Uh, there was a course teaching science to school teachers, which he managed to, to get on, despite not being a school teacher, as he said. Um, and he, so he got his scientific education, really, in that London context. Uh, his goal was to go to Cambridge. Um, he didn't succeed, instead of turning to UCL, where his, uh, one of his heroes, actually, George Carey Foster, later a very good friend, um, offered him a, a job uh, helping him to teach at £50 a year. Uh, and this allowed Lodge to live independently in London. If you go to the next slide, um, London, the London years are crucial too, as that's when he marries, he marries Mary Marshall. That's not easy to say. He marries Mary Marshall. Um, Lord Sullivan Lodge knew Mary from Stoke. He encouraged her to come to London uh, to study at the Slade, 
and then he began his courtship of her. Um, Lodge wasn't allowed to marry uh, Mary until he earned £400 a year. At that stage, he was only earning £150, uh, doing various jobs at UCL. Um, uh, but he responded to the challenge, and within six months, he had raised his income to £800 a year, which is quite a lot of money uh, in t t teaching science in the late 19th century. And so they marry, and uh, the first two of their children were born in London, Oliver and Rosie. Uh, so this is the statue in Liverpool. Lodge features uh, as representative of science uh, on, on one of the corners of the Victoria statue in Liverpool city centre. Um, the Liverpool years were crucial uh, for Sir Oliver Lodge. Uh, he took the job as the Leon James Professor uh, of Experimental Physics at the New University College, Liverpool. And this is where Lodge had the bulk of his scientific success. He gave uh, a well-received lecture on dust at the British Association in Montreal. And this work on spark phenomena in all of its different manifestations led to his real achievements. Um, uh, it also led to a correspondence with John Ruskin, the Victorian art critic, poet uh, and artist, um, which, which meant an awful lot to Swallow the Lodge. Um, and the letters are, are amazing to read between the two. It really is science and art coming together. Um, Lodge's work uh, on, on spark phenomena led to the Man Lectures at the Royal Society of Arts in 1888 on lightning conductors. This work then led to one of Lodge's key breakthroughs, which was the realisation that high oscillation, um, high frequency oscillation generated could propagate electromagnetic waves. Uh, and Lodge wrote, writes this up in his uh, journal article in the philosophical magazine on lightning conductors and notes it in the conclusion. And just as he's about to send it off, he realises he's been trumped by Hertz. And so he acknowledges this in, in a kind of postscript to the article at the end. Lodge then makes it his uh, responsibility to spread the word. He always credits Hertz uh, and he becomes a real champion, a real kind of populariser uh, of, of this concept. Um, as part of this process he, he gives lectures uh, at the, um, the Royal Institution and the Society of Telegraph Engineers demonstrating spark phenomena with Leiden jars and uh, there's a great anecdote that he tells where he, during a demonstration the caretaker comes into the lecture hall white-faced because sparks are running up and down the pipework <laughs> in the basins. Um, in 1894, uh, Lodge, uh, he's, uh, Lodge gives, the, um, uh, gives two demonstrations where he demonstrates the ability to signal through space without wires. Um, and these in the history of science are incredibly famous events and, and moments of dispute because, of course, three years later, Marconi patents uh, wireless telegraphy. Um, and you and, um, and all know the story, I'm sure, of um, this. Um, so, um, 1897 it also, though, is the year where um, Lodge registers his own um, telegraphy patents in Sydney, uh, which leads eventually to the Marconi Company buying Lodge out, right? a very generous payout. Liverpool's also where Sword of the Lodge discovers spiritualism. Um, he, he sees uh, uh, a man called Irving Bishop generate, uh, demonstrate thought transference, uh, so people uh, transferring their thoughts through space in 1883. And Lodge decides to investigate this, uh, joins the Society of Psychical Research, the SPR, in 1884, just a couple of years after it was founded. And this really broadens Lodge's intellectual circles. He gets to know people like Frederick Myers. Uh, the Sidwicks, Henry and Eleanor, who are really moving in the elite of British society, uh, both intellectually and in terms of culture as well. Um, he meets uh, Arthur Balfour, the future Conservative Prime Minister, through this set as well. And Lodge becomes really well known for his interest in spiritualism. In 1895, he's, he's involved in exposing uh, the fraud of Eusebio Palladino, um, and very publicly. And different parts of the press say it's embarrassing that sort of the lodge has been caught out by this woman. Other, other elements of the press say, well, it's good that he's exposed for fraud. And of course, the kind of reality of her, of her, of her demonstrations of the spiritualism is sort of what's at stake swirling around in this subject. Um, 1900, I'm going to say more about Birmingham in a second, but um, 1900, the lodges come to, come to Birmingham. They spend, 90, they spend 19 years at Liverpool, 19 years. Here. Um, and um, 
And in, in some ways, the history of the Lodge family sort of overlooks these years. But some really crucial things happened. In 1902, Lodge is knighted in the coronation honours. Um, he continues to work on telegraphy, setting up the Lodge Muirhead Syndicate. He, uh, he leads the new university while the buildings at Edgbaston are being constructed. Um, and this places him at the centre of civic life in the city. Um, and he continues to carry out psychical research. He becomes a figurehead for spiritualism in Britain, becoming the president of the Society for Psychical Research in 1902, the same year that he's knighted. And as I said, at this time, I think Lodge is probably the nation's most well-known scientist. He publishes a string of books and publications that consolidate him in his position as, as probably the leading thinker on psychical, spiritual, and, and, and the kind of the space between science and religion in the early 20th century. The Lodge family stay until the end of the war, and then they retire to Lake near Salisbury in 1919. So all of Lodge is rejuvenated in retirement. He's one of those people in which retirement does not mean retiring. Uh, he writes 16 books in this period, in his retirement. 16 books. Right? Um, Mary dies in 1929, uh, and Lodge lives on and uh, dies in 1940. So, Sir Oliver Lodge, prolific figure, many diverse interests, real technological and scientific contributions, particularly around spark phenomena. As a pioneer of wireless telegraphy and radiation, he is in many ways, I think, uh, the herald of the modern media world, a world in which information is routinely sent through space. We don't even think about wireless anymore. Uh, I mean that in terms of radio, but also kind of Wi-Fi and things like that too. He spans both the 19th and the 20th century. Um, my colleague Graham Gilley always points out that he was born in the year of the Great Exhibition, and he dies in the year of the Battle of Britain. Right? So he spans like, a huge and important period of history. And finally, Lodge was a really important public figure. He represented science, and he popularised it in a way that reconciled science, religion, and psychical research. Not always without controversy, but that, that's, that's what he represented. And these are all reasons why I think Sir Oliver Lodge is so important, but they're also, in, in various ways, reasons why it's easy to overlook him, I think. Okay, so, go Next slide. Thanks, Jane. In past years, uh, Lodge apologises for focusing on Liverpool in the 1890s. He says that he felt that these were the years in which he did his, most of his scientific work. But he also felt a particular bond, I think, with Liverpool and future. Thank you. Um, Lodge really responded to the job. He really relished his first appointment at the new university college. And he was involved in its transition from a medical school into a modern university. And he oversaw the construction of the new buildings at Liverpool. And Liverpool was an exciting and vibrant city, and Lodge took, I think, a certain pride in building up a scientific centre outside of London, and particularly Oxford and Cambridge. I think he felt a pride in being provincial. Um, he had, uh, he was fairly, he and Mary were fairly young, they were both in their early 30s when they went to Liverpool, and they had the following 10 of their children. So I think they felt very connected with the city. Um, and Lodge had all of the scientific success, um, really kind of coming together with the award of the Rumford Medal by the Royal Society in 1898. And 1898 is a year after the whole world, and I think Lodge felt that he was finally being recognised for his contributions to science by the Royal Society in 1898. And the city of Liverpool responded, throwing a banquet for, for Lodge. Um, in 1899, the Lord Mayor of Liverpool organises a banquet and Lodge is able to invite his friends. Um, Frederick Byers is there, George Fitzgerald's there, the chemist William Crooks and spiritualist William Crooks is there. Arthur Balfour comes along, who's then Chief Secretary for Ireland. And even George Wyndham comes along, who's in charge of the War Office. And this banquet happens the day the Boer War starts. So the man in charge of the War Office is at a banquet with Oliver Lodge the day the Boer War begins. <laughs> So the move to Birmingham then was a big deal for Lodge and the family, and he didn't take it lightly. He was invited by Chamberlain, uh, Lodge was playing golf at the time when the invitation comes. Um, Lodge turned down the first invitation to come to Birmingham, offering some other people who he thinks would be better. But he goes, uh, Chamberlain insists he wants Lodge. Lodge comes and he talks to some of his friends about it. Uh, Arthur Balfour persuades him to come on the basis, he says it's like a cabinet position 
you don't turn down jobs like this. You just take them on and you, you do them. And he comes to Birmingham and he meets some of his future colleagues. He meets Pointing, he meets Robert S. Heath, who's the principal of Mason College, the predecessor of the University of Birmingham. And he thinks that, he says that these are all men with whom I can work, he writes. So he then writes a letter, thank you, thank you. He writes a letter back to Joseph Chamberlain, a, a copy of which is um, in the Cabri Research Library. Um, and he says, OK, I'll come, as long as I can have uh, a few things. Um, as long as I can have a research laboratory. I'm going to become the principal of the university, but I'm still doing research. Uh, he says, I'll come as long as I can bring my assistants, Benjamin Davis and Edward E. Rob e. Robinson, and my secretary, Alfred Briscoe. Um, he says, I'm only going to come if I can keep on with the cyclical research as well. And he writes that as one of the conditions of his employment. Um, and he says in past years, I said that even though I knew it would be unpopular. Um, and he also says that he wants Robert Heath, the person who's basically replacing, to carry on and do the routine administrative work. <laughs> Which I think is cheeky, but smart. Um, <laughs> uh, next slide, please, Jane. So we come to Marymount, and that's my, that's my uh, that's a photo of Marymount, a much better one in the, <laughs> through, through there, just across the road from, from Raymond. Um, Lodge says that life was larger at Birmingham, with more scope than at Liverpool in spite of the wonderful friends of Liverpool, never to be surpassed. There's a real sense in past years that the world kind of opened up for the lodges when they came to Birmingham. And I think that's because of the kind of place that Birmingham was and the kind of job that all of the lodges were doing. Life was different for the lodges of Birmingham. In past years, he says, that we were not then in our first youth as we had been when we went to Liverpool. We were no longer a rather interesting couple. They were already established. They were middle-aged. Um, uh, and they brought 27 people with them. They needed those 26 rooms. <laughs> so in this next section, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to just talk about some of the aspects of Lodge's interests in Birmingham. And there's way too much to talk about in the time that I have. So I'm just going to pick on a few, a few things and just talk about a little bit. I'm going to talk about um, uh, education, first of all, uh, and then a bit about politics. And then I'm going to talk about Lodge and women, uh, because Lodge is quite, quite interesting in support for suffrage and and then I'm going to summarise some of the, the many different groups and organisations and projects that Lodge was involved in in his years in Birmingham. And through all of this, there's kind of mixing of the, the local, the civic and the national. Right? Being a civic leader put you on the national stage. Okay, thanks Jane. So that's a great picture, uh, the, the spy bird of sort of the Lodge. Uh, and it's great, it's, it's just labelled the University of Birmingham. Uh, and he's like the hot towel, I think. <laughs> it's so tall, and he just fits into the, into the frame. Um, there's a great quote in the Globe in 1909 that says, apart from scientific subjects, he, sort of Lodge, has written or spoken about most things in this world and the next, including school teaching, faith, and ether. In his spare moments, he runs Birmingham <laughs> University. <laughs> the early days of Birmingham were difficult. Um, Lodge had an office, so he worked in the council chamber, um, and he did let Heath kind of get on with it. Um, and he said that he was fine right, with this, but you have to wonder, it must have been tense coming in and sort of taking over as principal. Um, uh, especially at a moment where new buildings are being built in Edgbaston, but the university only started moving, moving departments over there in 1905, and the buildings weren't completed until 1909. So they were cramped into the city centre buildings, the Mason College buildings. Uh, Lodge had strong ideas about university education, and he could put them into practice uh, as principal at the university. He took an active role in appointments, seeking out people he thought would be great to to, to um, represent their disciplines. So he tried to get Michael Sadler to be the Professor of Education. And Lodge tried very hard to get Sadler to come to Birmingham, and in the end he didn't. Um, he tried to get G.K. Chesterton to be Professor of English. Um, uh, and again, it didn't succeed, but, uh, but, but he, he had a clear idea about the people he wanted to come, come down. But Lodge wanted a, a mixed curriculum at Birmingham. Um, he wanted there to be a common first year in which students would take all subjects uh, and then they would specialise as they go on. He, well, he didn't manage to get this um, through in the university. We have very, very strong ideas about the relationship between science and art, science and the humanities. 
Um, in, in, a, in one of his prize givings, he gave a lot, he went to a lot of prize givings as the representative of Birmingham University. He, um, he said that, um, he, said that he, he liked giving uh, books of uh, uh, works by Ruskin and Browning to science students because he wanted to kind of make people round. So science and the arts together. And in this he was supported by Chamberlain, who had similar ideas about education. Um, Mason College was a science uh, institution in the city centre, uh, and so Lodge felt he had to protect the arts against what could otherwise become quite utilitarian, given the kind of city that Birmingham was. Um, he also recognised that the arts professors were paid less, and so he had to sort of defend their interests uh, in this context. Um, he was also conscious about the way the disciplines broke down in terms of gender. He realised that the people of Birmingham sent their sons to do the scientific subjects and their daughters to do the art subjects. And so he was very conscious about this. So this is before the Edgerton buildings were built, Jane. Thank you. Um, this is before the Edgerton buildings were built. Um, uh, and the, 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 the Colthorpes, whose land we're on right now, um, gave uh, the university 25 acres down in Edgerton, uh, near, near Smoky Selyuk. Right? That's why it's down there. It's a long way from the leafy uh, borough of Edgerton, right? as far away as it could possibly be down, down that way. Um, and construction began in 1901. As I said, uh, it, the buildings were completed in inverted commas in 1909. If you know the layout of the University of Birmingham, you'll know they only just finished the semicircle of buildings a few years ago. Right? So it's still a kind of work in progress. Um, the construction of the new university uh, meant that the early days of the University of Birmingham were marked by severe financial problems. Um, Chamberlain did the bulk of the fundraising, but Lodge did his part. He wrote a pamphlet called The Survey of the Sciences in 1902, where he basically said, give me five million pounds, right, and we can build this university. And Andrew Carnegie said, only a fool would give a university five million pounds like that. Uh, he tried again with Lodge in 1970, making the same plea. So he obviously didn't listen and kept on, which is admirable. And he had all kinds of ways in which the university or universities could be funded in this era. Uh, Lodge was also involved to try and coax more money out of the city, uh, with mixed success, it has to be said. Uh, in past years, he complained about certain citizen members of the council who wanted to view the, uh, the professors of the new university as employees or officials of the council, rather than scholars in their own right. Uh, he said that um, for, the, for the council, uh, they thought that the terms for the, the professors seemed to be very short and the actual hours of learning comparatively few, while the so-called long vacation during which classes were suspended was a perennial bugbear. So he sort of thought the university academics didn't, didn't earn their money, unlike the hard-working people of the city council. Um, so Lodge uh, wanted the money, what money there was to be spent on faculty and students. Chamberlain wanted the money to be spent on buildings. He thought if you build ground buildings, the rest of the money would follow. Uh, and this was a sort of conflict that dominated the first few years. And the reason why, well, why the university campus is so spectacular, it has to be said. Um, uh, but for Lodge, Lodge can understand why you build a massive clock tower, right, rather than build classrooms right, and hire people. That has less kind of his, his attitude here. Um, but Lodge was interested in education more broadly. As I said, he often spoke about prize givings. He argued that um, teacher training belonged in universities. That it was, a, it was a serious, that you had to be trained to become a teacher, first of all, and it was a higher form of learning. Uh, he became a governor at King Edward's school. He was a supporter of the 1902 Education Act, and he rallied local educationists to help him with their pass through Parliament. Uh, Balfour was Prime Minister, his friend, so he was able to hand over uh, all of the uh, petitions that he'd done. He was a supporter of the Workers' Education Association, the WEA. Not just a supporter, he claimed he came up with the name. Um, which is disputed, it has to be said. And he gave lectures to working men in the city, uh, in the town hall, uh, and in, in various sort of, uh, uh, civic buildings uh, around the university. Lord Stu was interested in the education of his own children. Um, he was concerned about the quality of education in Britain's public schools. He was pretty anxious about where to send his sons, not having gone through the public school system himself. Uh, and he said it's only when he, um, he found emails that he became sort of satisfied uh, with, with the schools and the education they were in. Um, 
He wrote an article called, uh, in the 19th century, which is the highbrow magazine, called Our Public Schools as a Public Peril. Right? So he's really, really kind of anxious about this. Um, the girls uh, tended, to go, tended to attend school a bit, a bit more closely. And Violet went to the high school in Hadley Road here in Birmingham. Um, Honor and Lorna went to boarding school near Bournemouth. Uh, the youngest girls went to Edgbaston Kindergarten and Lodge knew the person who ran Edgbaston Kindergarten in this time in Liverpool. And then they went on to be nervous. Um, Lodge was a supporter of the kindergarten movement. Uh, he he uh, was one of the founders of the, the, the Birmingham People's Kindergarten Association. It was founded at Marymount uh, across the road and it provided um, early years education for the poor of the city. Um, so, so Lodge is interested in education both as uh, some working education but then also because of his own large family. He was deeply interested in their own education too. Jane, if you can move on. Ah, that's my summary. Can you move on again? Okay, so politics. Lodge's politics were, were broadly progressive. Um, he, he was inspired, deeply inspired, by Ruskin's views on political economy, and he was linked to a kind of loose Fabianism. Um, but what was, impre what was impressive for me about Lodge in politics is the way he was able to, to work with people of very different political persuasions at both the civic and the national level. And this is nicely illustrated by the people on my slide behind me. Well, over on the left is uh, Arthur Balfour, over there, who is a Conservative. Over on the right is Joseph Chamberlain, uh, a Liberal Unionist. And then in the middle are Beatrice and Sidney Webb, who are Fabians. And Lodge was quite comfortable working with all of these people across the political spectrum. And uh, he was very adept uh, at, at, at getting on with people uh, as people, actually, um, and despite their, their political views, and then, then getting them on the side for his various projects. Um, I think I'll just, I'll just leave, say, leave that, that actually and I'll move on. Um, so, so Lodge is, um, he's able to, to work with both Chamberlain, Balfour and the Webbs. Uh, he writes a Fabian tract for the Webbs. Uh, for Balfour it's a very personal connection. Um, Lodge and Balfour have shared interests in the philosophical dimensions of science, of spiritualism and of religion. Um, and, and Lodge spends uh, enormous amounts of time with, with the Balfours. Um, he spends every Easter, or well, Lodge and Mary spend Easter's with, with, with the Balfours uh, at the Wyndham's house, Clouds. Um, and through that set, actually, Lodge gets to know, uh, he gets to move in the upper echelons of Edwardian society. Um, but it's worth noting too that Lodge used his position in Birmingham to campaign, particularly on issues of foreign policy. In 1903, he called a town hall meeting about the Macedonian massacres. Uh, in 1906-7, uh, a letter by Le Lodge was read at a meeting at the Birmingham Midlands Institute, which is still there in the city centre, calling for action about the Belgian Congo. So he, he sort of knows politicians personally, but he's also moved by causes, by political causes too. And he's able to use his position to advance and give publicity to things he thinks need to be done. Okay, let's move on. So, so Lodge and women. Um, I just wanted to mention this because Lodge was a keen supporter of women's education. I've mentioned his aunt Anne, his sister Eleanor became the principal, the vice principal, I think, of Saint uh, Lady Margaret Hall, and then became the principal of Queen Mary uh, Queen Mary College, no, Westfield College, which is now part of Queen Mary University. So Lodge was um, surrounded by educated and, and powerful women, um, and I think that kind of encouraged him to support uh, movements to for women's education himself. Um, as principal, he supported the movement to improve the accommodation for, for women students, um, uh, including the building of University House, which uh, original buildings opened, which is a, a women's uh, hall of residence, uh, which initially opened in, on the Hadley Road and then came on to the University campus in 1908. He was also a supporter of, of the movement of the suffrage movement, too. Uh, he, in 1901, he addressed the Birmingham branch of the National Union of Women Workers. Uh, and in 1902, he addressed the Birmingham and Midland Women's Suffrage Society. Um, but the most, the most sort of, uh, exciting aspect of this, I think, is the last thing, the last bullet point, where in 1907, in response to a disrupted meeting in, in the city centre, uh, um, where some students in the University of Birmingham went along to break up a, a, a meeting by the suffragists uh, and they, they were stamping their feet so that the speakers can be heard and singing songs to drown out the speakers. Lodge was disgusted 
by this. And so he insisted the students invited Christabel Pankhurst onto the University of Birmingham campus to have a debate. Uh, the motion was, uh, the methods of the WSPU are best calculated to advance the cause of women's suffrage. Um, and Lodge described it as a, as a sporting thing, um, and there was a bit of joshing and all of that, but, but um, Christabel was able, she, she seconded the motion, so the advance, the first, the case was made and Christabel seconded, seconded it. Um, there were cheers, but the audience were, 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 were near the audience rejected the motion. The Times smugly noted that women in the audience were also keen to dismiss the motion. But I think it's important that Lodge was willing to kind of respond to what he saw as a kind of strange chauvinism amongst the students uh, and to try and give, uh, give the WSPU and Christopher Pankhurst a platform. And at that meeting, uh, a well known campaigner called Alice Paul was so inspired by the suffrage movement she became a leading uh, American suffragist um, uh, going back to America. Okay, civic life. And then I'll kind of bring this to a close. Oh, and again, oh, slide. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, this is my abbreviated list of the many different things that the Lodge was involved in while he was in Birmingham. I'm not going to go through them all, uh, I'll just pick out a few of them. Uh, the ones I'll pick out are the um, where he had lunch in the Union Club on Colmore Road. And he did that deliberately so he could get to meet the kind of hoi polloi, not the hoi polloi, the high and mighty in Birmingham society. Okay? So he, he knew how to network. Um, he, he went to um, the, the, dinners, the dinners and banquets of people like the silver makers, um, and largely it's a fundraising thing, um, but also the butchers association, right? all the guilds and societies of the city. You know, he'd often get these invitations, he knew he had to go along and try and encourage them to give money to the university to keep them on the side. But he was also interested in lots of other things. Um, there was something called the Birmingham Cosmopolitan Club, which brought together the Lord Mayor, um, Hallowell Rogers, who, uh, um, who was, um, oh, sorry, Hallowell Rogers, the Lord Mayor was the chair, Hallowell Rogers. And um, the, the Cosmopolitan Club was about exploring um, different European cultures. Uh, and they published a journal which had articles in English, in French, and in Esperanto. <laughs> so there's an kind of interest in the sort of Europeanism which Lodge was, was keen on. And he also um, was involved in the Shakespeare Reading Society, which, which met fortnightly. Um, and it brought together a range of educationalists on the University of Birmingham campus, um, both the, the scientists and the artists. And they'd just get together and read Shakespeare to one another um, every two weeks. Um, the, um, another one of these sort of, uh, um, sort of reading societies was the Ruskin Society, which was uh, something very close to Lodge's heart. And the idea there was that you could come along and you could say, you could discuss anything, as long as it's in the spirit of Ruskin. And Lodge used this actually to woo certain important people. So you got Herbert Sadler to come along um, and various kind of people he was interested in hearing. Uh, some of the things I, I, I really liked that Lodge was doing uh, were, were these. Um, he was, he was a, a mover and shaker in the afforestation movement. And this was an effort to, to I'm going to quote it here, to green the black country. Okay? So to plant trees in the black country and turn it into forests. Um, they reckon there were 300,000 acres of waste land in the black country. They began in 1903. In 1907, they were, part, they were planting in Dudley and Limor. In 1908, Wensley Corporation had a park um, and they planted reeds, wood, and Walsall. Uh, in 1908, they had 300 members and they all subscribed five shillings a year to, to pay for the trees in the land. Uh, they were aiming at um, 100 acres of planted land, but they thought there were 144,000 they could plant. Um, and they were doing okay. Uh, so at five pounds an acre, and if they got 300 members, uh, 100 acres would take them seven years to plant. But it would take them 9,600 years to plant the remaining 120,000 acres of the black country that needed greening. So there's a kind of environmentalism that the Lodge is interested in as well, a kind of greening. Um, he was a supporter of Birmingham's municipal institutions. He wanted, um, he wanted a municipal theatre. He wanted Birmingham to have a theatre. He, um, he, he wanted Birmingham to have a theatre, but he recognised that this was a tough ask in a city like Birmingham. He thought that Birmingham uh, people would probably prefer decent drains rather than decent drama. Um, uh, he also thought that um, Birmingham needed uh, better municipal leisure facilities, places where people could relax. And unusual for his period, he didn't mind if alcohol was served at these events. I mean, he, he preferred not to be 
uh, but he recognised that you couldn't stop people doing what they wanted to do if you wanted them to come. Um, but it's about recognising that even working people should have leisure time and should be able to enjoy it and mingle. Uh, he was also dead against tramps, this is my other Permian fact <laughs> I like. Um, the tram lines were going to come across just out here, um, and Modge wasn't up for that. <laughs> Partly because he thought the trams were backward looking, even though trams, uh, Birmingham's trams in those days were just becoming electrified. And you would have thought he'd be interested in that uh, as a pioneer of electricity. Um, but he thought trams were old fashioned. Uh, he was a key motorist. Uh, and so he thought that the, the tram was, was doomed. Uh, instead, the city should be investing in omnibuses instead. Um, but you have to wonder whether it was just he didn't like the idea of trams going past. <laughs> 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 Okay, thanks, Shane. Um, I will say something briefly about our lodge and the war. Um, the, the, the lodges were in Australia when the war broke out in 1914. Um, the lodge had been quite critical about jingoism in the build up to the First World War. He, um, science had long looked to Germany as an exemplar uh, of scientific education and scientific progress. Uh, lodge had been involved with the Quaker community in Birmingham in efforts to make links with Germans, uh, with, with, with civil organisations uh, in Germany, in, in the interest of peace too. Um, so he was quite perturbed about the jingoistic turn in British uh, culture uh, in the build-up to the war. Um, he disliked uh, plays like An Englishman's Home, uh, which is uh, by, um, by Du Maurier, uh, which is a kind of invasion of fantasy. Uh, Lodge was disgusted at this. He thought he was just whipping up fear and hysteria. Um, so, so when war came, Lodge was, was disappointed. Uh, he was put in an awkward position, having to defend his German colleagues at the University of Birmingham uh, as people were, who withdraw, were threatening to withdraw funds, unwilling to support a university that hired Germans. Um, but Lodge also thought and believed he should do his duty too. Um, and he worked on the War Committee at the Royal Society and he did, he did war work. But of course, the war, uh, the, 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 probably the most devastating effect the war had on sort of the lodge was the death of Raymond Lodge. Um, and uh, I won't say too much about that because I think everyone probably knows the, the story of, of, about, about Raymond and the book that comes out of this. Um, Raymond was probably Lodge's biggest publishing success, um, published in 1916. Um, it went through six editions within a month, um, and it went through two editions a year for the rest of the war. Um, and there were 12 editions in total before Lodge published Raymond Revised in 1922. And it's a curious book, um, and I'll say a bit more about it, um, as, it doesn't, as it kind of doesn't deal with, with grief, and yet it does deal with grief. I mean, it's the kind of unspoken thing at the heart of the book, I think. It is the family's grief for Raymond's death. So the war comes to an end. Uh, Lodge offers his resignation in 1918 and leaves the year after and moves to Lake. He'd, he'd probably been in Birmingham, too, he'd probably been working for the University of Birmingham for too long. Uh, Lodge tried to leave uh, in 1914, but the start of the war meant that he had to sort of see it out. But this was an important period for Lodge. He might not have had many more scientific breakthroughs, but he was one of the most eminent scientists of his day. It was also crucially when he established considerable authority as a public figure, able to speak to people about all kinds of things, scientific and technological change, uh, political movements, issues to do with spiritualism, to do with religion, the conflict between science and religion. Lodge had the authority to address all kinds of subjects and to be listened to. Um, and he did this from Birmingham, from his base as principal of its new university. Birmingham gave Lodge the opportunity to speak on the national stage, and in many ways, Lodge represented Birmingham. Okay, I'll just finish off now, okay? Uh, oh, and again. And again. And again. Thanks. Uh, I'll just finish up with some final thoughts about remembering Lodge. Lodge was 80 when he wrote Past Years, so perhaps it makes sense that he skims over his Birmingham time, focusing on the time of his youth. But why don't we know more about Lodge's time in the city? On the University of Birmingham's campus, there are Franklin and Pointing buildings, a Muirhead Tower, these are all names of Lodge's colleagues, but nothing named for Lodge. The plaque for Marymont, as we know, is on the desk <laughs> through there. It's not up anywhere in the city. Why, given his, the, his, the cons, Lodge's concerns in the period were so urgent at the time, has, I think, he become a marginal figure in histories uh, of the period? 
Well, there's nothing unusual in the selective way that lives are narrated. And it's not surprising, given that, Lod given that Lodge's primary career was as a scientist, that it's his time in Liverpool that's remembered. I think, too, that Lodge's long career makes causes problems for the way people imagine the past. You know, Lodge is both a Victorian and an Edwardian. He's both 19th century and 20th century. At the time, Lodge was seen as a figure at the cutting edge, a prophet of the wireless age. But looking back, I think, his spiritualism, his interest in reconciling science and religion, make him seem strangely old-fashioned, like a Victorian, out of time. But I think Lodge has much to tell us here about the way that people remember and are remembered. And I just want to finish up by turning to the way that Lodge imagined a kind of world in which nothing is lost. Thanks, Jim. So in, in past years, Lodge says that at an early age, I decided that my main business was with the imponderables, as they were then called, the things that work secretly and have to be apprehended mentally. And the most imponderable thing of all is something that was known as the ether. And this was a mysterious substance that was originally understood as the medium for light. Um, the sound travels, uh, it, sound is mediated by, by vibrations in the air, but light can travel through a vacuum. So there must be something that mediates light. And the ether was posited as the thing that allowed light to travel, to move. Um, but it also explained all kinds of other things, all of those electromagnetic phenomena that the Lodge was so interested in, electromagnetic waves, radio, things like that. Thanks, Jim. And with the discovery of the electron, the ether could account for all matter. Okay, this is the quote. Subject to all the laws of energy, largely the source of terrestrial energy, governing all the manifestations of physical forces, at the root of elasticity and tenacity, and every other static property of matter, the ether is just beginning to take its rightful place in the scheme of physics. And the ethereal corpuscles, I love that, the specks of modified ether, which we know as electric charges, are beginning to be recognised as substantial little entities in terms of which are, are to be interpreted the very constitution of gross and ponderable matter. So the ether explains everything. It explains matter itself as well as the forces that, that, that shape matter. The trouble was, though, that the ether was elusive. It was always just out of reach. Okay. Uh, Lodge says that duality runs through the scheme of physics, matter and ether. Matter appeals to our senses, but the unmodified ether makes no such appeal. It is so inaccessible that its existence has even been denied. Right? So the ether explains everything. It has this enormous explanatory power, but it can't quite be captured or proven to exist. And people have even begun to suggest that it isn't needed. I was writing in 1918, after Einstein's theory of general relativity, in the physical universe, the ether wasn't needed anymore. But for Lodge, it was vital, because it was the ether that bound together the physical world and the psychical world. For Lodge, the ether provided the ground, the common ground for mind and body, for matter and spirit. Now the imponderable, I'm not going to read like that. Now the imponderable ether, a perfect medium in which nothing was lost, provides the basis for the existence of personality after death. And this is Lodge talking about the concept of the etheric body. He believed that we had a version of ourselves that existed in the etheric realm. And because the ether was a perfect medium, your etheric body never, never perished, never died, went on forever. Okay? And it was Lodge's way of accounting for the survival of the, the, of the, survival of the mind after death. Um, the difficulty was making contact with these etheric entities, this kind of etheric double. Um, uh, in Raymond, Lodge described a relationship between medium and spirit control like this. And I love this analogy. The confusion, he's talking about the difficulties of communicating in a seance situation. The confusion is no greater than might be expected from a pair of operators connected by a telephone of rather delicate and uncertain quality who are engaged with transmitting messages between two stranger communicators, one of whom is anxious to get messages transmitted though perhaps not very skilled in wording them, while the other was nearly silent and anxious not to give any information or assistance at all. So there's the, hang on, there's the, uh, there's the, there's the spirit you're trying to reach, Raymond, say, who's trying desperately to communicate, and then there's the people in the physical world, say Sir Oliver, say Mary, who are, who are, who are trying not to give anything away, who are, who are being, trying to be as quiet as possible. 
And then in between the two are the, the spirit control and the media. And then Lodge finishes off. Um, yeah, so, so in between the two is the spirit control and the media. Um, so the, these communications, spiritual communications, involve kind of four people. The, per the people in the real, in the, the real world, in the, in the material world, the medium, the medium spirit guide or spirit control, and then the spirit you're trying to reach, Raymond. So there's four people. And Lodge manages it like a telephone exchange. Lodge's mind was relentlessly mechanical. And I like the way that Lodge here makes the spirit, Raymond, equivalent with the embodied Lodge. They're just two people at the other, at either end of the wire. They want to communicate have no choice but to rely on their intermediaries, <coughs> the medium and spirit control. There's an equivalence here, spirit or matter. It all works in more or less the same way. And this is where I'll finish. For me, there is something intrinsically archival about these attempts to reach the dead. Lodge's etheric body means that the dead are still living, but the ether as a perfect medium meant that anything that had happened, any time, any place, created ripples that were instantly transmitted, yet endlessly vibrated. The etheric universe was a great big archive in which anything could be stored and recovered. Lodge was a prophet of the wireless age in which people were connected instantly and at all times. Lodge's spiritualism might make him seem cranky, a relic of the table-tapping Victorian age, but his concern with the relationship between matter and spirit, material and message, make him seem curiously modern in an age of Wi-Fi and cloud computing. Lodge believed in spirit, but he knew that the spiritual was only tangible through the material. In other words, Lodge knew that the only way to manage the immaterial was with material. To bring back the dead, you have to use what they left behind. On the one hand, Lodge believed that nothing was lost. The difficulty was just how to make the connection to bring back the dead. His emphasis was always on mediating connections, on the people and objects upon which connections depended. This is an archival imagination in which doing things produces the past. But on the other hand, thinking about how Lodge has been forgotten it's useful to remind us about what we forget. If we can forget Lodge, and I know you folks haven't forgotten Lodge, <laughs> if we can forget Lodge, the most famous scientist of his day, and, and, and someone who looks like the archetypal scientist, then we can forget anybody. Lodge's curious obsolescence reminds us of the necessity of forgetting as we remember what we think is important. And perhaps the way that Lodge has become marginal reminds us that we need to keep going back to the archive returning to its contents and making new connections with the dead. <coughs> Not to bring them back, I don't think we need a kind of spiritualist history, but to remember the various ways that we necessarily forget. Thanks very much. an amazing polymath when it comes to Lodge, absolutely, and uh, we've had absolutely fascinating facts. I have to ask one question, has Julian Godley arrived yet? You are. We need to give you time to settle in, I think. Um, how should we do? Are there any pressing questions for Jim? Now, or would you like to catch him during lunch? I imagine say it's lunchtime. And I'm, 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 I'm also got quite a lot of facts as well that I've put out there about Lodge and stuff. There is one question about how. Just an observation, really. Not remembered at the university, but surely Lodge Hill Crematorium is named after Lodge. Sorry? And not Lodge remembered Hill. at the university, but surely Lodge Hill Crematorium. Is named after Lodge. Uh, I don't think Lodge Hill Crematorium is Lodge. I suspect it's another family. Oh, I don't know if Lodge was a support is it? Of the crematorium yes. movement. So, so maybe so it is. It could be. I don't know the history of Lodge Hill Crematorium. I don't know whether it was a family called Lodge that gave the land or whether Lodge was certainly around when the crematorium would have been built. And it's the sort of thing he, he was interested in the environment. We should find that out. I live in a road called Lee, after a solicitor called Lee, and, you know, things 
get named strangely. Right. Um, now, let me. Any more particular questions? I just wondered, did he not have any other children to go to the war? Uh, well, the, um, uh, the, the two sets of brothers, uh, the Lodge Plugs, I think, was taken over as, as part of the war effort, and then munitions were... And then, uh, I can't remember, you folks will know the details of this much more than I would, but the, the rest of the sons, uh, who was it? Noel, I think, wanted to sign up, but wasn't allowed because of his heart. Uh, and Lodge is grateful that Sedra um, damaged him in cross-country training because it stopped him signing up. Uh, and then the other Lodge sons were involved in, uh, the Lodge, let's say Lodge Plugs was involved in the war effort, and then munitions. And then the, 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 um, the daughters were in, um, Chamberlain's house was turned into a hospital as well, Highgrove up in um, uh, uh, Mosley, King's Heath. Okay. And they worked there uh, and, and the university. Thank you. Yeah, the, um, the other boys were in protected work because they were doing things to do with uh, gases and cleaning gases and spark plugs and they all counted as protected work and they actually wanted Raymond to come back and drop out of the war and uh, join in with them because at the beginning everybody thought the war wasn't going to last very long. So they were all protected. And Raymond joined up while his father was out of the country. I don't know whether that was significant, <laughs> but suspected it. Um, hello, I'm uh, Julian Godley and I am Raymond's great nephew. So Raymond was my grandmother's brother. Uh, and um, it's interesting that a lot of the talk today is about um, communication across the, the ether because my pianist cannot be with me today. <laughs> and uh, so uh, using 21st ether he has uh, recorded the piano parts of what we're going to sing and so this is a world premiere because uh, uh, it's only arrived uh, by email this morning so I hope it'll work uh, and, I, and I hope the volume will be okay as well so it's all quite quite tense and difficult but uh, anyway uh, we're going to uh, we I am going to sing um, four uh, songs which I hope are relevant um, the, the first of these uh, is a, a song that Raymond would have known, written by Vaughan Williams in uh, uh, 1901. Uh, it is uh, Lyndon Lee and uh, three verses about the countryside and the changing of the seasons and the loss of life through the changing of the seasons. Good so far. Oh. 
Let other folk make money faster in the air of dark room towns. I don't dread a peevish master, though no man may heed my frowns. I be free to go abroad or take again the homeward road to where for me the apple tree to lean down low in next song, uh, I should explain, I've been in the recording studio for the last three days solidly, so I'm, I'm uh, uh, that's where I've been. And uh, anyway, one of the songs we were recording was this lovely song uh, by uh, Wilfred Sanderson, uh, and this is a copy of the music that I picked up from the Wick, which is the Lodge family home in Barnt Green, and this uh, definitely would have been known by Raymond uh, because this was uh, uh, released and extremely popular in 1913. And it's a lovely song, a friend of mine, um, and it talks about uh, if you're happy, uh, let me hear your joys, if you're sad, let me hear your sadness and let's work together through the difficult times. Ah! <laughs> 
Um, uh, in our house, ever since I was a boy, uh, my, my, my middle name is Raymond, by the way, Julian Raymond, uh, good, good list of godly. Um, and in our house, we've always had um, two wonderful oil paintings uh, in our hall, one of Sir Oliver uh, on the left side in the hall, and the other of Raymond in his military outfit. And um, I've always assumed, my father's here somewhere, I've always assumed that I would inherit the, the Raymond picture. Thank you for confirming that. <laughs> so, um, so this last song is uh, a, a more modern song, um, but it talks in Italian of um, some of the things that Oliver, Sir Oliver and Raymond were discussing across the ether, which is... Uh, future worlds, um, and the song talks about imagining uh, how a future world would be free of, free of suffering and with cooperation and love, and it's called Nella Fantasia.
dialogue before people disappear for lunch, because some people may not be here after lunch. So before you disappear, could all the family come here for big group photographs? And then everybody else is going to find their lunch. So either you're picnicking here, or I suggest going up towards fireways. There's a Costa Coffee, there's the Morrison's to buy sandwiches, and there are shops, round that big roundabout up there. So go to the end of the field, take a right, and you end up at a very big roundabout. And we're going to start again at 2 o'clock, please. So have a good lunch time, and please, people, get your picture taken. silks and old brocade 
small faded rags in memory rich, so each to each with feather stitch. But if you stare aghast, perhaps at certain muddied khaki scraps, of trophy, fra trophy fragments of field grey, plotted and torn, a grim display that never decked white sheets before, blame my day's head, blame bloody war. So we're moving, we're moving on from a privileged Victorian Edwardian family to somebody who volunteered very, very early to go to war and was faced with such a great contrast in his life in the muddy fields of Flanders. And the family are going to take us on that journey. And Nicholas, who is Oliver's grandson, is going to be the first to talk to us. Thank you, Nicholas. Well, I must say, it was a privilege to be asked to speak today about Robert Raymond. And when I first agreed to do this, I thought I'd be talking to members of the parish of St. George's. But of course, this wonderful collection of non-lodge family was completely altered my talk. <laughs> so you, if I'm telling, if I'm talking to the already initiated, you'll forgive me. <laughs> Can anyone hear, everyone hear me at the back? Is the mic on? I have switched it on, I think, unless it's got... Don't need it. Yes, it is on. When we were being addressed this morning, I suddenly had a vision of two little girls running round this chair in excitement, running in this chair in excitement, having just moved to the edge of the and they were aged four years old and they were my mother and my mother's twin sister and of course this is where my mother grew up i've never been here before and i was rather thrilled and excited at the thought that i was here in my mother's childhood which was a very happy one do you mind if i sit down <laughs> <laughs> This time last year, we were recalling the events of 1914 on the centenary of the outbreak of war with Germany. And in particular, we were remembering all those young men who went abroad to fight for their country and never returned. One of those young men was Raymond Lodge, my mother's brother. And his home was here in Edgbaston. He died exactly a hundred years ago this week, so we're now commemorating the centenary of his death. He spent the greater part of his life here in a house called Marimont, just a few hundred yards from this church, probably less than that. And no doubt some of you will remember him, and for anything, unless there were centenarians in the church because the Marimont was demolished some years ago so I believe so I never saw it but I believe it was a beautiful house and a happy one by all accounts Raymond was the much loved younger son of Sir Oliver Lodge and his wife Mary and his death left the family in shock and he was mourned deeply his parents put up a monument in the back of the church and his father, Sir Oliver, wrote a book, a very remarkable book, called Raymond and Life and Death. It was about his son and his unrelenting efforts to communicate with him in the afterlife. No one in this church today knew Raymond, but we do know a good deal about him, from family archives, from photographs, and from the letters which he wrote home from the front in Flanders.
I was in fact asked a short while ago if I knew Raymond. I may look a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> I have to point out that as many years after his death, I was born. I've said that Raymond spent the greater part of his life in Edgbaston, but he wasn't, here, wasn't born here. He was in fact born in Liverpool in a house quite near to the university where his father was professor of physics. These were fruitful years for Sir Oliver, years in which his most important scientific work was carried out and his international reputation established. He also found himself the father of 12 children. <laughs> he was justly proud of his large family and particularly pleased with the neat symmetry of their sexes, six boys and six girls. <laughs> He also found himself, he was, not, sorry, he was also much older, I'm sorry, I was, he was also older with one exception than all the girls. He was the youngest of the sons. So Raymond was right in the middle, younger than all the brothers, older than all the sisters. So I think this made him that little bit special. I've always thought of him like that. Sort of imagine if there was a, a, a family disagreement that the boys versus the girls, Raymond would be there to mediate between them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Of course, nothing like that happened, but it's a nice, nice conception. Sir Oliver always maintained that of all his sons, Raymond was most like himself at the same age. There were some physical likenesses, similar abilities and tastes, and they shared a love of engineering and machinery. Raymond, however, was no good at physics, but compensated for this by having a keen sense of humour. He perceived at once the funny side of things and was known at school as a ready wit. When they were young, Raymond and his brothers had a craze for making fireworks. Sorry, I lost myself. One Sunday morning when everyone was in church, they let off a terrific homemade bomb. The explosion was heard for miles around and many windows were smashed. <laughs> Not in this church, I hope. <laughs> One would have expected their father to be furious, but in fact he was able to sympathise, remembering his own experiments with fireworks when he was a boy. I think Raymond was a bit of a perfectionist. He liked doing things well. There was the occasion when in the army he was given the job of building a, a shelter using sandbags and old bricks. He put all his skills into it, and when it was finished, the ser sergeant asked him in all seriousness if he was a bricklayer in civil life. <laughs> Raymond wrote in a letter that this made him awfully proud. <laughs> After school, he studied engineering at Birmingham University. Then he went on to complete an engineering apprenticeship at the Wolsey Motor Works. He and his brothers all loved cars. There was their passion. And two of them set up in business together, calling themselves Lodge Brothers Limited. And after university, Raymond joined them in the firm, and that firm later became Lodge Plugs Limited. He owned a motorbike, and his first car was a Nagant, a name I'd never heard of, but it's apparently a very well-known French car firm in those days. It had a canvas roof which should be rolled back, and when the family went on holiday to Woolacoon, they were transported there by Raymond in his nagant. So he had a happy childhood, and a happy upgrade. Then war came. 
when war was declared on the 4th of August 1914, a wave of patriotic enthusiasm swept the country. A massive recruiting campaign resulted in a huge response. Raymond considered it his duty to volunteer, and he signed on straight away. This must have been a difficult decision for him. His mother and father were away in Australia and could not be contacted. No doubt he discussed his decision with his brothers. Surprisingly, he signed on with the South Lancashire Regiment which drew its numbers from Liverpool, rather than the Warwickshire Regiment, which would have covered the area around Birmingham. Raymond was commissioned into the 3rd Battalion of the South Lancashire Regiment in September 14, perhaps, perhaps within a month of the outbreak of war. And one thinks about this today, how a young man of his age should suddenly become an officer in charge, say, of 50 men, something like that. And I think it was the shortage of junior officers, subalterns, at that time that impelled them to look as, for, for officer material, as the army think called it, officer material, someone well educated, someone with a, able to discipline men, able to discipline himself even. And that's what they must have found in Raymond. And in no time at all, he was second lieutenant Raymond Lodge. As, as, as lieutenant Lodge, he underwent training, first in Scotland and then in Liverpool. On the 15th of March the following year, that's within six months of him uh, volunteering, he was ordered to go at very short notice to France. He had to report that night, leaving him just a few hours to go home to Birmingham to pack and say goodbye to his family. He took the midnight train to Euston, accompanied by three of his brothers. They saw him off at Waterloo and he continued on to Southampton and eventually to Boulogne. It was another week before he arrived at the front when he found himself near to the city of Ypres in Belgium. The Ypres salient, sorry I can't say that name. The Ypres salient, as we know, was one of the most dangerous areas of the Western Front. The line which extends from the English Channel to the Swiss border. The front line at this point was mostly disconnected trenches and shell craters. There was no effective shelter from the persistent rain. The fields were waterlogged and soon turned to mud. Constant tiredness from struggling over sodden fields left the men exhausted. The German lines were only a few hundred yards from the British trenches. The heavy artillery was miles behind the lines so that the air, air over their head was full of fragments of shrapnel from exploding shells. And on one occasion, they were attacked with poison gas. The conditions in the trenches were really terrible. Three weeks of the front line exposed to the elements and constant gunfire, sniper fire and heavy artillery. There was persistent rain and flooding trenches. The troops slept on sandbags, living in wet clothes for days on end. Three weeks is a long time to live continuously in wet clothes, boots and putties, he said. Four days without removing them, shoot their boots. On another occasion he wrote, before we were relieved I had to turn up with 50 men and work till midnight in water up to one foot deep. So at 8.30 with my boots full of cold water, I set out on them till 12 and then marched eight miles. But in the next letter he was able to write, I'm still well and happy. <laughs> 
In April, he was given a short spell of home leave. His 19-year-old sister would always remember the agony of him leaving them at the end of the leave with a mixture of pride and apprehension and the dread feeling that they might not see him again. You may ask how I know this. Well, this 19-year-old girl was my mother. On the 14th of September, when he was leading his man back from one of the trenches, he was hit by shrapnel from an, air, from an exploding shell and mortally wounded. He died later that afternoon. He was buried in a garden near where he fell, beside the men in road, between two trees. He was 26. That's all. I was standing at the bottom of my staircase and someone snapped it before I could object. <laughs> because you've almost got exactly the same angle on your face, it's very clever. <coughs> anyway, whoever snapped, that was very clever. Now, my that, son is sitting there. <laughs> oh, well, maybe he's the guilty party. <laughs> yes, he he was very telling, was he? Yes, well, that was a, such a... It is extraordinary to have, when one's studying history, one reads books, but it's extraordinary to have a tangible vocal link because you've heard from your mother who knew Raymond. So we feel as though we've been in contact with the family and that's a great privilege. So thank you very much for doing it. I knew my grandfather uh, and uh, I visited him on two or three occasions when I was very small. And he sent me a birthday present, I remember a primer of chess, and inside he wrote, hoping that you will beat me soon. Mm. <laughs> yes, I think he says in his books that he used to like to play chess, and Raymond took a chess set to war with him, I know that. So I hope that um, you have a chance to look at the memorabilia, and I'm extremely grateful to the University of Birmingham, because they have supplied some really, really special memorabilia, which includes items found on Raymond's body after he died. So we've got his spectacles, his hip flask, his seal, and his gun cleaning pouch materials. And I know inside that he's written his name in his own writing. And that gun cleaning pouch comes from a, a gunnery shop in Birmingham. And I know from the gunnery shop that uh, Sir Oliver bought a periscope and sent it out to Raymond so that he could be a better sniper because Raymond was a great expert in gunnery. And um, Birmingham University didn't know this and I didn't know it, but Nicholas has got two very special items from Raymond in the trenches, both signed by him. And there is... Um, now, how are you going to describe yeah, these? Really the first is a field service pocket book in which it contains everything that a young officer ought to know. And it's the most detailed information, a lot of which I think was probably irrelevant. It was probably written by civil servants for the Pearl Wall. <laughs> uh, these, these two documents have been in my family for since I can remember. Yeah. Should, should come pick I'm in here to the Birmingham Museum. So, um, the other thing is more interesting <laughs> This is Raymond's message book. And you see a number of loose red with carbon copies, in which if you want to give an order to troops down further down the trenches, he would write it here in pencil, tear it off and send it to a, a, a soldier, and he would run with it to the next trench or so. And these, of course, are in Raymond's writing. So I'd like the university to have that. So these, these two extraordinary items are going to be given to the University of Birmingham for their archive collection of Raymond Lodge pieces. And his notes of court are written in pencil. 
because it rains so much you couldn't use a fountain pen and certainly somebody carrying your messages would have had to have had it in pencil. And one of the gentlemen we are commemorating tomorrow, a private belcher, asked his parents to send out lots of pencils so he could write letters. So that's, I think, well, that's a, a by story. But perhaps Claire from the University of Birmingham would come up and receive these on behalf of the university. I'm sure they'll have to do technical things, but we'd like to make the gesture because I have no idea it was happening. And I think that's very, very generous. The library and archive collections are open at the University of Birmingham if you do apply to want to go to see the things. I was felt very privileged to go and have a wonderful poker out there one afternoon. It was fascinating. No, sorry, I don't know very much about this specific film, but it's made by Deborah Skinner, who's my sister, and I was Colin Lodge's um, wife. Colin was Sir Oliver's. Grandson. Grandson, thank you. And um, my sister is very is a video artist, and she's very interested in ethereal, um, in writing, in combining um, sound and words with film. Um, she's won quite a few awards, and she was particularly interested in the story of Raymond and in Sir Oliver Lodge's um, pursuit in trying to communicate after he died. And um, she, she became interested in this because she's got a, a severely, severely autistic son who appears to her to have um, communication levels or experiences that reminded her of this pursuit of Sir Oliver's. So she um, created this film, uh, especially for today, um, with those uh, thoughts in mind. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, and do you know, are, are the words all from the letters? That's what I don't know, but I believe they are some. But I, yes. I think I was told that. Right, let's see if we've got some letters out. killing time, and our time is so pleasant, it doesn't need much killing out here. The days are all along, nice sunny days too, bringing us near us. <coughs> Last night, 16th to 17th, the whole battalion went out digging. There had been a tap by the English early the same morning, and the enemy's guns were still very busy even in the evening or night. The whole battalion was ordered out digging to consolidate the captured positions. We got halfway out and then got stuck. Death is real and grievous and is not to be tempered by the glossing timidities of those who would substitute journalese like passing on, passing over, etc. for that awful word. But it is the end of a stage, not the end of the journey. The road has been in a kind of trance since last night and I dread to wake up 
He was a very fine friend to me, especially since Fletcher went away, and I miss him frightfully. They sent over some Johnsons, but these all went too far. We were screened by a reservoir embankment. However, we had to pass through a ruined village, and they knew it, so they put shrapnel over it. Still, we were unaffected. The road stretches on beyond that inn, and beyond our imagination. The moonlit, endless way. He died there, about an hour after he had been admitted, having never recovered consciousness. If he had to die, I am thankful he was spared pain beforehand. It made my heart ache this afternoon, packing his valise. I have given his chocolate, cigarettes and tobacco to the mess, and I have wrapped up his diary and a few loose letters, and made them into a small parcel, which is in the middle of that. Lionel for chocolate received, and Alec for Gordulis. I've sent another box of surplus kit home, addressed to Noel, rather late to do it, I know, and I shall want one or two of the things sent back later, but not for a long time. Still, we were unaffected, but when we came out into the open on the far side, we caught it properly. Shell after shell came over and burst above us. The letter from Violet and another from Margaret yesterday I understand they've gone up to Edinburgh now. I shall like to go up there too, off the wall. I am in the trenches again, quite like old times, and quite in the swing again after the unsettling effect of coming home. You know, I can't help laughing at things out here. The curious aspect of things sometimes comes and hits me, and I sit down and laugh, not insanely. Our road was blocked in front, owing to the moving of a lot of wounded. And while we were held up in a little field path alongside a hedge, we had several shrapnel shells over us. To add to the horrors of the situation, they had put some gas shells over too, and we were obliged to put on our gas helmets. He was rather scared. I let him back round the corner again and put him in a ditch. I looked up and saw the air full of flying pieces, some large and some small. These spattered down all around us. Shell after shell came over and burst above us. The end has never been a Christian doctrine. An evidence collected by careful men in our own day has perhaps needlessly upheld with weak props of experiment. The mighty arch of this leads very much for the socks. They are quite all right for size. Perhaps not so long and narrow in the foot might be better. I'm very sorry to say I have to tell you the very worst of bad news. Life of the Lodge family, 
and Julie Carter is going to speak now. Um, and she has been looking into the use of mediums and seances by the Lodge family. And uh, she will take us further on in our story. Okay. Now, Lodge was educated in a way, in science, uh, to not believe in survival. He had a Christian upbringing. He was a communicant member of the Church of England. But that, in, in his youth, was somehow separate from the problem of survival. Do our souls survive death? In fact, his, his teachers and his big influences, Jim talked about earlier, Huxley and Tindo, the zeitgeist really was very much against the idea of a survival of the human soul. In fact, um, Oliver, when he was very young, even argued with his aunt Anne about this. Anne said that she thought there was, had to be some kind of survival. Wasn't that in the Bible? Wasn't that a religion promise, something like this? It must be true. And Oliver, when he was young, argued against her. She apparently said to him, all right then, I promise you, if I can, I will come back to you and I will tell you that I've survived. And we'll see where that leads a little later. I see him as a very sophisticated psychical researcher because of his attitude towards mediumship, again. Um, a statement from Raymond, where he talks about um, Mrs. Glas Mrs. Osborne Leonard's um, spirit control, Fido. So of course she was a, a trans medium. Um, he is very fair and sophisticated the way he thinks about how Mrs. Leonard gets hold of some of the information. And I quote, he's talking about um, Fida's statement about Raymond's experience of the afterlife. And he is rather concerned that perhaps these statements are being gleaned by Mrs. Leonard from popular books of the time. Um, he's not saying that's fraud, he's saying that she might have read these books for her own education and, and interest, and that while she was in the trance state, her spirit control feeder might have actually been talking, um, uh, putting out things from the books. He says, I confess that I think that feeder may have got a great deal of this. This is Raymond's afterlife, his experiences. Perhaps all of it, from people who have read or written some of the books referred to in my introductory remarks. But in so much as her other utterances are often evidential, I feel that I have no right to pick and choose especially as I know nothing about it, the afterlife of the world, one way or the other. And then he says, some of this feeder talk is at least humorous. So I think that's a very um, positive attitude towards the mediumship. Now, he first got interested in these things, really, um, by looking at non-physical action between living human minds. The SPR had been set up in 1882, but Lodge didn't join until 1884. He says in his autobiography, I didn't join immediately. But in 1884, he was drawn into some experiments in a large linen warehouse and shop in Liverpool called Henry Lee and Co. I think Jim was talking about that earlier. There were some um, experiments going on there about the thought transfers. In fact, some of the girls had been to see this performer that Jim was talking about, Irving Bishop, and they started to actually do this between them as a sort of joke, as, a, a, as an amusement. And it was found that some of the girls were very good at sending thoughts in a non-physical way to other girls. Now, it's been suggested that the girls had some kind of code, secret code, so they could make the researchers think they were being psychic or, or, or telepathic when they weren't. But actually, the more I look into it, the more I think this is not the case. Um, Frederick Myers was there, other academics from Liverpool University were there. Uh, Lodge had the experiments under his control. 
and there were screens put between the girls sometimes. They were even in other uh, separate rooms sometimes. Um, the items were hidden that the uh, sender was thinking about. The receiver had no way of knowing what that drawing was or what that um, object was. But quite often, um, they got very good results. And by the end of those experiments, Lodge, who had control over them really, more than Byers and more than the other um, academics that came in, uh, was convinced that there was some form of non-physical thought transference. And in fact, it was Frederick Myers who coined the word telepathy for this kind of activity. I didn't know that that was such a recent word, actually. From then, from this idea that living minds could influence each other in a non-physical way, then we could make an extrapolation that possibly, even when somebody has died, if mind can operate independently of the body, perhaps that mind can still operate when that person has died. And then some people say, well, no, it's impossible because it's our brains, isn't it? If you don't have a brain anymore, you've died, you don't have a working brain, it's impossible. There can be no more personality, no more thoughts, um, no more identity as an individual. And I used to think that that was the opinion of science. And I used to think, I used to imagine, perhaps, that science was some kind of unified edifice that had, you know, this is the opinion of science. <laughs> our minds are our brains. Our minds are a product of our brains. But actually, when I started to look into it, and look into psychical research, I realise that there is no unified um, edifice like that. There are many, many ideas and conclusions and tentative conclusions within science about the origins of our consciousness and where it comes from. One scientist said, not too long ago, looking for the origin of personality and mind inside our brains is a bit like rooting around inside a TV set for last week's broadcast. You won't find them. They weren't coming from the TV set in the first place. So it may be something like that. I think um, what speeded Lodge on his way to become so interested in researching survival was perhaps the publication of a book as well by the SPR in um, 1886. And that was Phantasms of the Living. And that was reports by people who'd seen, perhaps you could call them hallucinations or visions or, or, or phantasms, of people um, at a distance, say a relative, someone you love very much, someone you're very close to, um, someone who was in a terrible crisis point, either the point of death or maybe falling or, 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 or you know, all from a or something like that. And this book came out, and it was the first time the SPR had put out a very serious and very well researched um, encyclopedic, um, encyclopedic book that was really the first work of very serious um, psychic research. Um, they'd only been uh, founded since 1882, and by 1886 this, this book came out. Um, Lodge had joined the society in um, 1884, and he became more and more interested. And his big breakthrough, I think, to survival research was his meeting with Mrs. Piper, the American medium, who is still baffling researchers when they look into how she, you know, if they're, if they're totally sceptical and they say, oh, this is not possible, Mrs. Piper, as well as Mrs. Osborne Leonard, who is in the Raymond book, Mrs. Piper would totally baffle them. William James, brother of Henry James, um, in America, um, he was a physician as well as being a psychologist. Now, he didn't believe in any of this stuff, but he found it all very interesting. He didn't believe in the whole, to begin with, he didn't believe in the, the idea of a personal survival. But his wife, had actually heard from some other female members of her family 
that, oh, you have to go and see this Mrs. Piper. Now, this was in Boston, in the United States. Um, they came back, the female members came back home after seeing Mrs. Piper. And uh, Mrs. James was telling uh, William all about this. And he decided he would actually go and see Mrs. Piper so he could tell his wife and the female members of his family how all this was done and how they shouldn't take too much notice of it. Well, he went to see Mrs. Piper and he was totally, totally baffled. There were facts about living members of his family, deceased members of his family. Um, he could see no way that she could have found that, that information. He went there anonymously. She didn't know who he was. Now, um, William James was, was, was so baffled by this, he contacted Frederick Myers. Uh, Frederick Myers uh, thought that, uh, yes, Mrs. Piper should definitely be known to the, the English Society for Psychical Research, because there's an American one, the ASPR. So Mrs. Piper was invited to England. She worked through a very strange, a sort of control, spirit control, or was it part of her personality? Who knows? Was it some kind of split off from her conscious mind? We really don't know. And she worked with this rather strange French doctor or herbalist called Finouy, who, it was said, knew little French and very little medicine. So we really don't know if this was sort of part of Mrs. Piper's unconscious mind or whether it really was a spirit control. Who knows? Lodge um, found this um, sitting with Mrs. Piper, like William James did, he found it totally baffling. And I think um, what really punched it home to him, that this was something definitely paranormal going on. He said his Aunt Anne ostensibly took possession of the medium and in her own energetic manner reminded me of her promise to return to me and in her well-remembered voice. <sighs> um, it wouldn't have sounded exactly like uh, Mrs. Piper's voice because Mrs. Piper, remember, was American. But Lodge does say something about how, through Mrs. Piper, because she's American, and this sounds awful today, but um, he said that the speech is cheap and somewhat. It's not quite as refined as it should be. Now, he, he heard from his Aunt Anne, or what he construed to be his Aunt Anne. But he was very aware that just to tell people or write up an article about some subjective experience like that was just anecdotal evidence. And scientists don't really take a lot of notice of anecdotal. Oh, that's just anecdotal. You'll need thousands of cases like that to correlate and, and codify. And, you know. So what he decided to do, when Mrs. Piper was in England, invite her to stay in his house in Liverpool, hide all objects, like the family Bible, photographs, anything that would give away anything about the history of the family, engage a whole new fleet of servants for the time she stayed there, which is what he did. And he thought then he could have control over these seances, over these experiments with Mrs. Piper. Now, the ASPR, and a character called Dr. Richard Hodgson, who was the most skeptical, the most ruthless of the psychical researchers. He was very good at um, unmasking fraudulent mediums. He, he was a very um, skeptical and, and hard-headed kind of character. He'd had Mrs. Piper followed, he'd had private detectives following her, her husband. <laughs> and when Mrs. Piper came to stay in Lodge's house in Liverpool, he had her mail opened to see whether she was having information sent from anywhere. Mrs. Piper, as a very gen genuine person, I don't think a very intellectual or educated person at all, she was totally understanding about this. She wanted to be studied. She wanted to know what was going on when she went into these trances. So she didn't mind. Um, he said that, you know, when members of the family would stop in the middle of a sentence and just smile, she would find that acceptable. Oh, they obviously don't, don't want to say something in front of me because that will ruin a piece of evidence. After 22 sittings, 
So there's Aunt Anne, there's um, other family members that um, speak to Mrs. Piper. Um, he makes a report to Frederick Myers about Mrs. Piper's mediumship. He says, the personality active and speaking in the trance is apparently so distinct from the personality of Mrs. Piper that it is permissible and convenient to call it by another name. The facts on which she disperses are usually within the knowledge of some person present, so could this be to let her, though they are often entirely out of his conscious thought. Occasionally facts have been related which have only been verified after. Now that's even more interesting, because if no one in the room is familiar with the fact, and then it checks out afterwards, that is very interesting. She is also in the trance state able to diagnose diseases and to specify the owners of, uh, the late owners, the owners or late owners of portable property. In the midst of this lucidity, a number of confused statements are frequently made, having little or no apparent meaning. But the facts and the very evidential things apparently were kind of inserted in to these um, uh, sentences which, which didn't really mean much at all. So they, they, the researchers talked about Piper's mediumship, grafting in information which meant something, flashes of lucidity and very evidential statements. The best one really, apart from Aunt um, Anne, is, and Lodge wasn't particularly sentimental about this uncle of his, Uncle Jerry. We didn't know Uncle Jerry very much. Lodge's old uncle Robert, who lived in London, was one of twins, the twins ran the family. His twin Jeremiah had died 20 years before. Lodge wrote to his uncle Robert and asked him to send some relic of Jeremiah because she could actually get a lot of information from her, her watches and jewellery and things like that. In the post, he received a curious old gold watch which he handed to Mrs. Piper when in a state of trance. Finui, the French doctor, the, um, perhaps the split off from Mrs. Piper's um, subconscious, Finno told him that the owner had been very fond of Uncle Robert, with whom the late owner was very anxious to communicate. And Lodge writes, after some difficulties and many long attempts, Finno caught the name Jerry and said emphatically, as if impersonating him, this is my watch and Robert is my brother and I am here. Well, that's actually quite, um, quite extreme kind of language really to use. Now, Lodge told the Jerry communicator that if he wanted to make Robert aware of his presence, that's his twin, who's still alive, he should recount some detail of their early life together, something that Oliver Lodge didn't know about. Jerry he mentioned swimming in the creek, killing a cat in Smith's field, charming boys, the possession of a small rifle and a skin resembling a snake's skin. Robert, his twin brother in London, can remember nothing of this, but then Lodge wrote to another brother, um, Robert wrote to another bro brother, Frank, an old sea captain living in Cornwall, who confirmed all the details, including the existence of Smithfield near the Barking Creek, where the, the brothers grew up and killing the cat. So, if Mrs. Piper was rifling through living mines, she was rifling through the, the mines of an elderly man who was living in Cornwall. It's very odd, isn't it? very strange kind of occurrence here. Now, if these spirits could um, influence the minds of mediums when they were in trouble, many female mediums, I must say, although there were a few men. If they could actually um, uh, 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 dictate writing through a in trans medium, could they actually affect physical material? Could they manifest physically? And how much more time have I got? I'm absolutely fine. How long have I been Okay, so um, physical mediumship is kind of, sometimes it can be a bit of a dirty word in the, dirty expression in the, in the psychical search community because so many of the old physical mediums in the Victorian era, of course, did get up to fraudulent things. And all this business about it must be in the dark, or it must be in the semi-dark. I mean, it does make you wonder, doesn't it? But, however, Lodge's um, attitude towards mediums and psychical research, which I, as I said before, considered to be very enlightened and sophisticated, he was aware of the important nature of these mediums, but that didn't make him dismiss the whole of the medium's work. In fact, when he investigated Eusebio Palladino, the Neapolitan medium, 
we were talking, uh, Jim was telling us about how he, he was, um, felt it was his duty to say publicly that she'd been doing fraudulent things. But he still believed that some of her phenomena were genuine. And I'll tell you the reasons for this. He said that the things she affected by trickery, and I'm quoting him, the things she affected by trickery were very feeble. Now this is the picture I have. This is an island in the Mediterranean, Ile Rouba. It's owned just about by Michel, a friend of lodges and like a researcher. It's a very remote place. Very remote. So there's Richet's house, which was a, 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 a not a refined kind of house that's on this tiny island. I should imagine they didn't even have any gas lamps there, they didn't have oil lamps, candles. Um, so there's the one house, and there's, there's the cottage of the lighthouse people, that's the only other house. And the fisherman and his wife lived in Richet's small house there. The fisherman's wife was the cook. Richet's secretary came to take notes. So there's very few people on this island. It wasn't that easy to get to. The seance room door was locked. So we <coughs> all this in, in by oil lamp probably or candle with this um, really quite um, peasant eyes, <coughs> really Neapolitan woman, Eusapia, middle-aged woman, stout, terrible temper she'd go into if anyone mentioned bandits, because her father was murdered by bandits. Um, it must have been well, incredibly spooky kind of atmosphere. Seance room door was always locked. Things continued to happen. Um, Richet and Lodge would maybe hold one of her hands. Um, Myers and Okorovich, the Polish investigator, would hold the other hand. Her feet were restrained in a piece of apparatus, as they called it. All these men sort of investigating this woman. Very interesting, isn't it? Um, so things continued to happen. They, they had actually, um, uh, uh, to a certain extent, that she was actually trying to free one of her hands. But the very interesting things that happened, she couldn't have done even if she freed her hand. This is the interesting thing about it. Um, just a, a, because I don't have long now, but just a little um, a taste of the things that happened there. Lodge went into the seance room one day, and he was determined he would have control over these seances. He took a musical box down from the ceiling, which was hanging up by the ceiling, so he was very tall, he could just reach it like that. It had a luminous paint smeared on it, so in this semi-darkened room, if it moved or something, you could see. He wound down the mechanism, the wind-up mechanism of the musical box, and he hung it back up on the hook by the ceiling. Eusapia was a long way away from the musical box, sitting around the table. There was the secretary taking notes for researchers, locked door, and they said to her, get your control to wind up the musical box. And she was, oh, John King, the John King. He was her control. If you don't restrain my hands, I, John King will make me cheat. She actually used to say that the spirit control would actually force her to cheat. So it was all a very mad kind of scenario going on. They actually heard the musical box winding up. And you can't mistake that sound. Apparently it came down off its hook, floated around the room slowly, landed on Frederick Myers' chest. I don't think all those highly educated intelligent men could have missed seeing or what this physical mediumship has to do particularly with survival is another thing I want to argue about. But this crowns it all. They're sitting in the dim light. A supernumerary limb. I watched this protuberance, they called it the pseudopod. I watched this protuberance gradually stretching out in the dim light until it reached Myers, who was wearing a white jacket. I saw it approach, recede, hesitate, and finally touch you. Myers responded by saying he being touched. Now, isn't that odd? You see this strange. Um, uh, Richet, who was whose uh, island it was, whose house it was, actually invented the word ectoplasm to describe the substance that this supernumerary name was made of. And Lodge wrote, 
It was as though there was something or someone in the room which could go about and seize people's arms or the back of their necks and give them a grip. Everyone felt them. I once felt a long hairy beard as if from a man standing behind my chair. Very spooky, isn't it? So they saw this um, pseudopod. Um, this is rather controlling Eusapia. Um, the musical box. And they said that the, the, the raps and bangs on the table while these seances were going on were so loud as to feel dangerous. It was like someone had a heavy mallet bashing his table. Was it the secretary? Was it one of the researchers? Lodge says none of us were making these banging noises. So the whole Eusebia thing is, is, is a mystery. She did do forging things. She certainly did. Lodge said they were feeble phenomena. She was um, then invited to Cambridge. Uh, Mrs. Myers didn't trust her. She didn't like England. It was cold. Uh, a few things happened, but um, uh, Dr. Richard Hodgson, the, the um, ruthless um, investigator, actually caught her free in the hand. And after that time, he had nothing more to do with her. Lodge is more balanced about it. Yes, she does do strange things. She does cheat. But John King makes her cheat. Okay, um, another five minutes? Five minutes. Five minutes. There's the huge thing in, in Oliver Lodge's uh, life of psychical research was the cross correspondences. Now I've got another five minutes. <laughs> the cross correspondences went on from late 1901, so Myers died in January 1901, to 1932. In the end, those who used to analyse these um, automatic writing scripts of the cross correspondences said, please no more, we haven't got the time to analyse all this stuff. Some of these things were actually, these scripts were actually 40 pages long when they were typed out. Myers died and four automatic writers, automatists, um, one in India, Roger Kipling's sister, Mrs. Holland, two in Cambridge, Mrs. Farrell, the um, Cambridge lecturer in classics, um, later Mrs. Piper, they all seem to be receiving information from deceased SPR members. The idea was rather like an engineering, electrical engineering idea of correlation, if you can get the same thing through different channels and you can compare them. Um, it did seem that the Myers P control, who came to Mrs. Piper, had sometimes the same memories as the Myers W control, so this is with it, and sometimes the Myers V control could remember things that the Myers P control said, the Myers V control, the switch coming from Mrs. Ferris. This went on for a long time, one in India, one in America, two in Cambridge, and Mrs. Willett somewhere else in England. Uh, but a, a huge, huge, I still haven't all been analysed actually all these weeks. And I don't think there'd be many people today with the knowledge of ancient Greek and Latin uh, to, to really um, you know, make sense of them, unfortunately. Um, I was going to, if I had time, um, read an account of a trumpet seance um, written by Honor and published in Raymond Revised. I don't think I'll have time to do that. And so I can... Um, Leave it open here if anyone wants to read it. Um, can I have two minutes just to... Honor's yeah. account of the trumpet sounds. I don't know if you've all heard of trumpet mediumship. This is all very, very bizarre stuff. Honor writes, January 1917. They go along, and this is Raymond's mother, Raymond's sister, go along um, to a private house near Birmingham with the Scottish medium, Mrs. Roberts Johnson. Honor writes, I could soon feel great waves of vibration, almost as if one were on the sea, although no one was stamping, going through the floor right under my chair, and soon the whole circle felt these, also a breath of cold air. After we'd been singing for some time, a deep Scotch voice came very suddenly out of the trumpet, or at least from the neighbourhood of the trumpet, saying, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This was said to be the chief trumpet control, David Dubry. We continued to sing. Then the voice came again saying, you're going on all right. Later on, missed a bit out here. Soon the trumpet came over to us. 
And Mrs. Johnson said she could see quite a young man in khaki standing in front of me, holding a pad and pencil. The trumpet then said gently to us, Bang, bang. The second syllable indistinct unless one had known him. I'm here. We spoke to him without repeating the name and asked him if he had a message for us. <coughs> Tell Father I've been. This was all very low, but both recognised the tone of Raymond's voice absolutely. And uh, a little bit later on, he hears um, from Mrs. Leonard that um, there was another, there was a cross correspondence there. Um, Mrs. Leonard in trance tells him that um, Raymond is telling me you went, you heard from him, he spoke properly. It was a room with lots of people in. It wasn't at home. Things like that. So, um, so just to, to sum up now, as a conclusion to this. I don't feel psychical research is going to give us all the answers. I think there's always going to be a huge mystery here. Um, one of the most prominent uh, modern psychical researchers, Dr. S uh, Professor Stephen Broward, um, he's becoming perhaps a little more uh, sympathetic to survival as he gets older. But he was asked the other day, there's actually a film of him on YouTube, and he's asked, um, do you really think there is survival? I know you believe in psychic force, but do you think there's an individual personal survival? And he said, there is so much evidence for it, but it's not a slam dunk. Now, you contrast that with Oliver Lodge's um, attitude towards it. And he said he was as sure of after-death survival as he was of our existence here. That was a slightly different, um, different opinion. I don't think there are any very definite answers to it. Um, I feel that the mystery is always there. Um, it, that makes for more different interpretations, more works to be uh, written on it. Um, I don't believe it's absolutely a slam dunk. I think there's a lot to be said for it. And I think, I think um, you know, it's helped me a lot to get involved in this kind of research. Um, and I can live with it not being an absolute slam dunk. Well, thank you, Julie. And we can imagine the family having their seances just over the road, table tapping, table wobbling. They wore out one table, it broke, they had to get one with stronger legs. And they did the same, banishing the servants and so on. And uh, this went on for years and years and years. And I don't know whether Georgina is going to tell the story of the photograph. I'm not. You are not. <laughs> but I expect the Rodge family know this extraordinary thing where Raymond was supposed to have described a photograph that had been taken of his company out in Flanders and <laughs> described it very accurately. And the family knew about it through psychical experiences before the photograph arrived home. And so Lodge was trying, through his scientific research methods, to go into this behaviour. So we get the extraordinary duality of the man. And, and others as well. Um, it's been a really interesting time. Um, I'm a residential canon at Worcester Cathedral, and I just thought you might like to know that um, in the cloisters of the cathedral, we have a number of very fine stained glass windows that were erected in memory of um, people who died and had connections with the cathedral who died in the First World War. Not all of the windows of First World War memorials, but um, a number of them are. And um, last year, when we were remembering the outbreak of the First World War, we uh, held a very special service, as a lot of churches did, and we put, um, they are plastic, but they're poppies. We put poppies into the windows, that the lead stands away from the windows, and we were able to slide poppies around the names of every um, person that we could remember in, in the windows. And uh, we also remember um, by name on the 100th anniversary of their death all of those who are commemorated in our windows. And I was just thinking about this because we did have uh, somebody who uh, was killed on the same day as Oliver Lodge, as, as Raymond Lodge, and uh, so we remembered him on the 14th of September. Um, so I just thought you might be interested in that. Uh, so I've been interested for a very, very long time in the. Um, 
what you might call the interface between orthodox religion and popular culture, so the teachings of the church and uh, cultural uh, religiosity that we see and hear around us and I discovered that spiritualism is one of those places where religion and popular culture crossed and I've spent I think probably about 10 years um, investigating a little bit more about what the church was saying about what happens to us when we die and what spiritualism was teaching at around the same time somewhere between 1850 and 1939 and if you're at all interested it's not a plug but um, there is a very good book on the subject um, written by me so if you're interested in anything that I say it's hideously expensive, like lots of academic books are, but uh, now it's been remained with, it's probably cheaper on Amazon. So. Um, so I'm going to start with a definition. I'm going to give you a definition of spiritualism. Spiritualism is, at its simplest, the outworking of the belief that those who have died can and do communicate with the living. And this out outworking has many forms. It has been dressed as a science somewhere on the borderland of telepathy or ESP, as we've been hearing. It's been the subject of philosophical and theological lectures. There are, even today, performance mediums for whom transmortal communications form the basis of a stage act. It is a practice beloved of teenagers gathered around Ouija boards, scaring themselves silly in the process. It's offered by mediums to people seeking reassurance in the time of bereavement because they cannot find it in traditional religion. But however it manifests, it manifests itself, the root and core of all spiritualism is the belief that the dead can and do communicate with the living. Now unlike a number of other um, popular phenomena, modern spiritualism is very easy to date in its beginnings. It's widely acknowledged that it began in the home of the Fox family in Hydesville, New York State, in the United States, in March 1848. Two younger daughters of the house, Katie, who was 12, and Maggie, who was 15, claimed to be communicating with the spirit of a departing man through means of racking sounds. The spirit answered their yes and no questions through the tracks. So the neighbors became interested. The two girls began what can only be described as a checkered career in public displays of spirit communication. As they developed their techniques, other people began to discover their own mediumistic talents. And in the autumn of 1852, one of these, Maria Hayden, crossed the Atlantic, landed in London, and began offering seances in fashionable salons. And at a similar time, away from London, Spiritualism flourished in a different way in the towns of Yorkshire and in Keighley in particular. But from this point on, and certainly well into the 20th century, spiritualism became embedded in popular imagination and proved attractive to many people. Now the reason I say that it was attractive to many people is that experimentation in spiritualism, in its many guises, extended far beyond the boundaries of any sort of authorised movement. By 1939, the Spiritualist National Union claimed that there were 520 local spiritualist societies serving some 160,000 individuals in England. But thousands more attended seances, visited spiritualist lectures and read about it in the newspapers. And significantly, table tilting, as it was commonly known, was something that anybody could do in the comfort of their own home and without any particular expertise. It was popular across the country and among people of all classes. Queen Victoria was known to have tried the spirits, and Gladstone, Thackeray and Dickens visited seances, as did their servants. One of the things that I've written a lot about is how the Church of England responded to spiritualism. And as you might expect from the Church of England, the response was mixed. Here, on the one hand, was a very popular phenomenon which purported to give proof of life after death. And as such, it seemed to support the Church's fundamental belief in life after death and many churchmen were initially very enthusiastic in their support. However, 
The vision of the afterlife that the departed spirits communicated was strikingly at odds with traditional church teaching. Additionally, some clergy expressed anxiety about the way in which mediums preyed upon the vulnerable bereaved, and there was some unease about prohibitions in the Bible concerning necromancy. In the periods of the First World War, the church continued this uneasy relationship with spiritualism. Many churchmen condemning it, some endorsing it, but at the same time, generally appropriating some of its popular imagery in order to minister to the vast numbers of bereaved parishioners. So what we had in the 19th century was a phenomenon, the dead speaking with the living through mediums. This phenomenon, as I've suggested, manifested itself in a variety of ways, from very serious lectures to musical theatricals. It was discussed in national newspapers and journals. It was attempted around kitchen tables. And there were spin-offs from this phenomenon. Some people tried to contain it in almost like an organised religion, creating groups and societies for the furtherance of its beliefs. There were, mostly in the 1860s and 1870s, celebrity mediums, usually young girls, who were courted by the popular press until they were exposed as frauds. <coughs> by the 1890s, it was still around, but no longer with such an enthralling and exuberant aspect in popular culture. Before we turn explicitly to the early 20th century though, it's important just to pause for a moment and pay attention to what it was that the dead were saying to the living, not least because I think this is highly significant during the period of the First World War. Now I could go on at great length about the theological or philosophical structure that underlay spiritualism, but I haven't got a huge amount of time and there are other things that I'd like to talk about, but I will share a couple of um, important points in brief. The first is that spiritualists believed, and still believe, that death is the gateway to the afterlife. When a person died, they found themselves in a place that was variously called the spirit world, or summer land, or summer world. Communicating spirits explained that they were initially confused by their surroundings, and didn't realise that they had died even, because they awoke in a place that appeared quite similar to the earth that they had left. Many spirits described the sheer beauty of what they saw as they developed in their spiritual life. What they saw was, if you like, earth made perfect. And thus their communications were full of vivid descriptions of landscape, of streams, flowers, trees, colour and light. Somebody rather rightly suggested that it was a bit like an English summertime. Um, that was how it was always described. The spiritualist afterlife was also very dynamic. A spirit was not merely expected to wander at its surroundings, but to grow in spiritual understanding. And most commonly, this growth was described as an upward movement. The afterlife was stratified into spheres or realms, and a spirit was considered to have made progress when it rose upward through these realms. The higher the realm, the more refined and perfect in spiritual knowledge the spirit had become. Even from the darkest realms, there was the possibility of spiritual growth and forgiveness. The traditional Christian doctrine of eternal punishment was almost always explicitly denied and many spirits communicated that hell did not exist. You can now see why some people in the church were going to have problems. Neither was there any divine judgment. Instead, when a person died, their spirit simply entered a sphere that was appropriate to their earthly spiritual development. God was usually present, as was Jesus. Although the spirits were uncertain as to whether Jesus was divine or whether he was rather the highest and best of spirits. Again, another problem for um, Christian ministers particularly. This was what the alleged spirits of the dead told the interesting living, interested living from the 1850s onwards. And very little of this message has altered since. So the question would be, why was this such an attractive message during the time of the First World War? 
Now, when I told people that I was researching spiritualism, the most common reaction I had was, oh yes, it all started around the time of the First World War, didn't it? But as I think I've demonstrated, it was well established in English culture by then. But the reason that people think it didn't arrive until then is because it did enjoy a significant revival during the Great War. On the face of it, the reason why it revived from 1914 onwards is blindingly obvious. An awful lot of people found themselves bereaved and wanted some sense of comfort in their grief. But why did they turn to spiritualism for that comfort? Well, this, I think, is the triumph of spiritualism. What was in the late 19th century by turns a parlour game, a fraud trick, a musical show, a scientific experiment, a new esoteric philosophy, became at this point something else and something very significant. It became a source of comfort and hope. People visited mediums in the 1860s when they were bereaved, but they visited for many other reasons too. A lot of people were simply curious about an unusual phenomenon. There was no internet in those days to keep them amused, obviously. By 1914, the vast majority of people sought out mediums for one reason only. They had lost someone. Spiritualists responded to this. Those who were mediums offered their services, often for free, and gone were the tricks, the flowers falling from ceilings, the violins playing by themselves, just a medium, a departed soul, and a grieving relative, and a control. The theological content of spiritualism had not changed at all, but the packaging changed and became more sober and less frivolous. One of spiritualism's more famous advocates was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, who became convinced by spiritualism in the 1860s, largely as a result of his own bereavements and a lot of reading and investigation. But during the war, Conan Doyle set off around the country, giving lectures to packed halls about the teachings of spiritualism. He wrote of his exertions, quote, a great body of information which has come to us is information which purports to have come from the dead. When I formed the opinion that this was true, I saw at once the enormous importance of it. I thought nothing that I could do in connection with it would be too much trouble. Here were many people in this land needing consolation so badly. So many mothers who had lost sons and wives who had lost their husbands. Rachel's mourning and without comfort. If only they could keep in touch with their dear ones, what a comfort it would be. <coughs> we have an insight into his motivation in his choice of phrase, Rachel's mourning. <coughs> a reference to the slaughter of the innocents in Matthew's Gospel and the sound of mothers grieving their lost sons. As a bereaved father and husband, Conan Doyle had an authentic voice. That and his considerable fame as a writer meant that his lectures were very well attended. Along with Conan Doyle, another key figure in the story of spiritualism in the Great War was, of course, Sir Oliver Lodge. Following sittings with Gladys Osborne Leonard, through which he encountered his son, he published Raymond, which became a bestseller. The reason why it carried such strong currency was that despite being say, a bit stilted and at times confusing as a book, the personality of Raymond, playful, kind and brave, comes shining through. Within the complicated and protracted descriptions of seances, Raymond, through the mediums, articulated a desire to set his family's mind at rest by assuring them of his own well-being. Lodge's critics derided some of the passages in the book as crude. Most famously, Raymond described to his family how soldiers passing over were initially confused as to where they were, and as a result, looked for familiar objects and sought to satisfy familiar needs. One soldier wanted to smoke a cigar, although when one was offered to him, he decided he didn't really want it and a friend smoked it instead. Others wanted to drink. Quote, when they first come over, the, over here, they do want things. 
Some want meat and some want strong drink. They call for whiskey sodas. Don't think I'm stretching it when I tell you that even the heavenly angels can manufacture that. It was this passage, more than any other, that was criticised. In a lecture given at St Martin in the Fields on the 14th of February 1917, Viscount Halifax, President of the English Church Union, launched a scathing criticism of Raymond, concentrating unashamedly on what he described as the more foolish passages of the book, such as the one above. In response to such criticism, Lodge wrote Raymond Revised in 1922, in answer to the eyebrows raised over the whiskey sodas, he counted, he counted, quote, My son is represented as saying that when people come over and are in a puzzled state of mind, hardly knowing where they are, they ask for all sorts of unreasonable things, and that the lower kind are still afflicted with the desires of the earth. Imagine an assembly of clergymen in some retreat, where they give themselves to meditation and good works. And then imagine a traveller arriving, mistaking their hostel for an hotel and asking for a whiskey and soda. Would that mean that alcoholic drinks were natural to the surroundings and part of the atmosphere of that place? It doesn't make 21st century clear, do you have to say? <laughs> the book says that in order to wean these newcomers, from sordid and unsuitable, though comparatively innocuous tastes, the policy adopted is not to forbid and withhold, a policy which might over-inflame and prolong the desire, but to take steps to satisfy it in moderation until the newcomers of their own free will and sense perceive the unsuitability and overcome the relics of earthly craving, which they do very soon. In similar fashion, Lodge upheld the accounts of games and songs offered in Raymond's conversation. He argued, quote, It may be true that when spirits are the souls of men made perfect, they may not have need of games. But if young fellows remain themselves, then games and exercise will not seem alien to them, at least at first. Remain themselves. This was what lay, I think, at the heart of the book's popularity at a time when many young men were dying in war and being buried in foreign places away from their families. Raymond suggested that the dead continued beyond the grave and were the same people that they had been in life. They were perfected over time, but initially were recognisably the same people as when they had lived. As late as 1947, after the Second World War, the images evoked in Raymond were still influencing the public imagination. One clergyman noted, for example, in a mass observation conversation, that his congregation talked glibly about heaven and angels. Quote, like Oliver Lodge and Raymond, who were supposed to have said there was good whiskey there, they hope there'll be good beer. <laughs> Medium Lodge visited Gladys Osborne Leonard was one of many who spoke about how they had been affected by the First World War. She was an amateur medium and actress until 1914 when she found herself deluged, her word, by spirit messages telling her that something big and terrible was about to take place in the world. Other mediums similarly recounted in spiritualist newspapers how they had felt suddenly a pressing need for their services many bereaved people and numbers of lively spirits clamouring for their attention. Of course, critics of spiritualism, especially in the church, argued that unscrupulous mediums saw the war as an opportunity to prey on the vulnerable and make money from the grief. But if this was the concern of the church, what alternative was it offering? We might suppose that the established church would, as it does now, respond liturgically and pastorally to such a widespread national sense of bereavement. But the church of the early 20th century did not respond. It did not have the means. It's easy for us to forget that in 1914 and in 1918 even, the Church of England's liturgy was the Book of Common Prayer and that was it. There were hymn books, but hymns were not generally sung at funerals. 
There were, from time to time, special prayers issued by the authority of the Privy Council. We are, in the Church of England these days, rather adept at creating liturgy out of thin air, responding to national crises and putting things on the internet pretty quickly. The early 20th century church had no such flexibility. To be fair to the Church of England, the institution, as everyone else, was dealing with a new situation. Large numbers of dead young men, conscripted, not ordinary soldiers as well, whose bodies were not repatriated, again, very different from today. All that the church had liturgically was the Book of Common Prayer, which according to serving army chaplains was, quote, semi-used and semi-usable. It was pretty useless at home as well because the order for the funeral service um, presupposed a body. Some clergy began inventing their own liturgy, locally, offering services akin to funerals for those who had lost husbands and sons in the war. In London and then elsewhere, small shrines popped up outside churches as people prayed for those overseas, with a roll of honour noting those who had died. And in some instances, these became the permanent memorials after the war. As well as having little room for manoeuvre liturgically, initially the church had a problem theologically and pastorally when dealing with grief on such a scale. Now to understand this, we have to go right back to the 16th century and the Reformation. At this point, you may remember from your history, the Church of England dispensed with the Catholic doctrine of purgatory, that interim state between heaven and hell, and took a more Calvinistic approach. If there was no purgatory, it followed that there was only heaven and hell. Judgment of the individual soul came at death, and the soul's eternal destiny was fixed and unchangeable. God would not change his mind because he is changeless, and there was no possibility of post-mortem repentance. By the mid-17th century, attitudes to this were changing slightly, but only on the fringes of the church. It wasn't until 1853 when F.D. Morris published his theological essays that the first real challenge to this theology came. It's quite a complex theological argument based on the translation of a Greek word. I'm happy to distill it for anyone interested, but it really does go into quite a lot of detail. But gradually, theologians and churchmen began to question openly this traditional doctrine. Perhaps, after all, it was possible for a soul to repent beyond death, be forgiven, and be restored to heaven. What, in the 1850s, was a rather shocking suggestion, was, by 1915, almost a commonplace. The problem for these academics and more liberally-minded churchmen was that when they tried to explain it, it either sounded like purgatory, and again, you have to remember that at that time, nobody wanted to be thought of as a Roman Catholic, or else it diminished the idea of hell, and hell as the ultimate sanction was thought to be a good thing for social morality. They didn't have the linguistic or the liturgical framework to explain what they were on about. By contrast, spiritualism offered a clear and frankly rather friendly alternative as a landscape of the afterlife. There was no hell, post-mortem spiritual growth was a given, and the dead were happy and concerned that the living should know this. And if you were a grieving mother whose son had died in his late teens, which set of beliefs would you find more attractive? So how did the church respond? Some clergy did endorse spiritualism, although they tended to endorse the idea of it rather than encourage the practice of visiting mediums. They were few in number, and in some cases a little on the fringe of Orthodox church belief more generally, but they spanned the full breadth of church tradition and could be found all around the country. Some of them even joined together to form the confraternity of clergy and spiritualists. Others called for a return to the tradition of praying for the departed and the notion of the communion of saints, which had been lost in the Church of England. People turned to spiritualism, they argued, because the Church of England had no prayers for the dead. 
These tend to be more Anglo-Catholic clergy or laity who are already keen to encourage this more Catholic practice. And indeed, in 1917, the Church of England issued forms of prayer which did include a petition that God would forgive the sins of those who had died and increase their understanding of his will. It's rather difficult for us when we're dealing with flat ecclesiastical language to see just how revolutionary such phrases were. They caused some controversy. Letters were written to the Archbishop of Canterbury. But there were phrases which found their way into post-war memorial services and which do not sound at all radical now. But they suggested that post-mortem repentance was possible, that God might change his judgment, and that spiritual growth was a possibility beyond death. Church memorial services and sermons took on a new tone. Phrases that were common currency in spiritualist circles, such as passing over, summerland, the dead being just as they ever were and growing, were heard on the lips of bishops as they addressed congregations. The church most certainly did not adopt spiritualism, but it found some convenient words and phrases to express a theological change that had taken place some 50 years earlier. With all of the serenity, pomp, majesty and solemnity that it could muster, the church did, at the end of the Great War, respond liturgically as well as pastorally to the national grief. On the, surfaces, on the surface, these services and monuments that were left behind were granite-like, traditional language and liturgy. But look closely and you will see the influence of something a little more radical, a movement which was primarily focused on enabling the spirits of the dead to speak with and offer comfort to the grieving, and a new and more optimistic theology. Oliver Lodge played no small part in the doctrinal evolution within the church by giving to the reading public something that was born of family love and a deeply held conviction that the love and care that we have for one another continues beyond the grave. Not only do we continue to love our departed, but they continue to love us too. They grow, they develop in their spiritual life, and they want to share the joys of their new life with us. Perhaps as much as Oliver Lodge, who had the courage to publish and defend his work, we have Raymond Lodge to thank for that insight. Thank you. The lodges were absolutely fascinating. Father, son, um, the meshing together of love, the spirit, the science, and we're still thinking about it, whether we're theologists or whether we're investing psychical things. So it, I think it's a fascinating topic. And um, Georgina, as Georgina has said, she will answer some questions. So let me tell you. Were, were there any human spirits? Um, it, it's difficult to answer that question. It depends. It sort of depends when you ask, uh, when, or what period um, you, you're asking. There were people who were explicitly Christian spiritualists, um, and there were publications that were for Christian spiritualists. Um, there were an awful lot of um, spiritualists, certainly in the latter part of the 19th century, who didn't want to associate themselves with traditional church teaching um, and. Um, Although they wouldn't have described themselves as atheists or possibly even humanists, um, they didn't want to be associated with the church. So um, there was a group, uh, for example, who um, started uh, a spiritualist lyceum movement, which was a sort of spiritualist Sunday school, um, because they didn't want their children going into churches and learning the traditional uh, teachings of the church. So. Um, Kind of on the borders between uh, humanist and 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 more. Ex I mean, you have to remember the period in which we're talking, uh, which we're talking about. Um, people just people just were 
if they were English, they were Christian. It was it was quite hard not to be, um, but certainly they were on. Some of them were on the on the edges of that. Um, I was very interested in what you said about um, the angels manufacturing the whiskey and soda or the scarf. I think maybe there was a bit of revision done between editions book. 